And God bless you, friend, and welcome to ABN and the Trinity Channel. My name is Chris Palmer, and I want to take the opportunity to welcome you to our International Apologetics Marathon. You know, we have a phenomenal show prepared for you today. I don't want to waste any time. I want to get right into it to give our speakers the time they need to get through the material. Our show today is entitled, Is ISIS a True Representation of Islam? You know, there's so much that's going on in the world today, a lot of terrorism in a lot of different places. Last week, we just saw what happened in London, England. A gen uh, several people were killed right outside of the uh, bridge there in England, and ISIS took credit for it. And the question people have today is, is this true Islam? Is ISIS really fundamental Islam, or is it a made-up version of Islam. And so we have speakers here that are going to take to answering that question today in the form of a debate. It's going to be real good. Let me introduce to you our speaker. Our first speaker is Yusuf Ismail. He is a qualified attorney engaged, engaged primarily in trial court criminal defense. He has studied at an undergraduate Islamic study center. He has been with the Islamic Propagation Center International for a decade as a consultant and is engaged in numerous publicly moderated debates with noted Christian apologists such as William Lane Craig, Mike Lacona, John Gilchrist, James White, and Jay Smith. And his primary focus is on the divine authority of religious scripture, the relevancy of religion in the 21st century in concept of peace and violence is, is in Islam and Christianity. Yusuf, welcome to the broadcast today. Thank you very much, sir. And I'll I was of the view that um, Osama Dagdok would be going first and I'd be going second because the topic is basically framed in the purpose of defending, defending Islam. The original format was that Osama was going to go first and I was going to go second okay. in terms of our opening statements. Yes, that's uh, the format that we have, Yusuf. Thank you. And we want to introduce to you our other speaker and our other debater it will be Osama Dagduk. Osama is a Christian apologist. He earned a bachelor's degree in theology and a master's degree in missiology from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the author, the author of two important works. His first project, The Generous Quran, is an accurate English translation with study notes and material to help Christians share the gospel with Muslims. Second, exposing the truth about the Quran, the revelation of error, a two-volume expose of the Quran and Muslim scholars. In 2001, Osama founded the Straight Way of Grace Ministry. He travels throughout the United States and Canada equipping Christians to be effective witnesses of Jesus Christ to their Muslim neighbors, as well as ministering to the Muslims directly. Osama, welcome to our show today. Well, thank you, brother. It's my joy to be with you and all the wonderful audience which we will be meeting with for the next two hours all over the world. May the Lord bless our time and may the eyes will be open and the heart will be tender to hear what we are about to share and may the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be represented to all those who will be watching this program live right now and in the future as you watch it uh, as a recorded program. Osama, we have uh, a format for the broadcast. Yusuf, we've agreed that uh, Osama would begin with a 30-minute opening statement. Following Osama's 30-minute opening statement, Yusuf will have a, a, a rebuttal to that with 30-minute opening statement. Uh, so. If you're watching, stay tuned as uh, we begin with Usama. Usama, go ahead and open up with your statement. Well, thank you so much. It is uh, my joy to be here for the next 30 minutes to cover some of the material which will be continue as we go. As you see on the screen, we have the picture of ISIS. And uh, you see uh, the title we have is Revealing the Truth About ISIS. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, we have so much to cover about ISIS. First of all, let's look at the flag of ISIS. When we talk about the flag of ISIS, we talk about the foundation of Islam. And that's amazing here in the West, people look at this flag and say, that's an evil flag. But at the same time, when they look at this other flag, the green flag, they could not see anything wrong with that flag. Uh, because that is the Saudi Arabia flag, which we assume in the West to be our friends, our allies. No, the difference between that green flag and that uh, black and white flag is, is actually two things. The color of the flag and the sword. But both statements which are written on both these flags are the same. It is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, which is... The foundation of Islam, the Shahada. Without it, Muslims cannot be Muslim. Now I'd like to let you talk a little bit about that first statement which come from Sahih Muslim, where Muhammad said, literally, that's what he said, I have been commanded 
to engage in war against people till they testify to the fact that there is no God but Allah and believe in me that I am the messenger and in all that I have brought. This is the foundation of Islam and that's how Islam state started. Not by ISIS four or five years ago, but by Muhammad, the self-proclaimed prophet of Islam a good 1435 years ago. Muhammad set the stage for how Islam state will continue. It is him engaging in war with people to force people to become Muslim. And if you don't say the Shahada, you don't have to believe in it, just say it. If you don't believe in it, he and his followers, the Sags, the early Muslim founders of Islam will be killing you, taking your wife and your daughter as concubines and slaves to take over the world. Now we ask the question, how many of the early, how many of the early uh, Arab who lived in Muhammad days really, truly, truly believe in Islam? Watch me on the screen here. It said, it said, the bad one said, the bad one said, here we go, I gave it to you. The bad one said, we believe. Say, you did not believe, but say, we surrender. That is becoming Muslim as a result of fear. And the faith has not entered your hearts. That is the truth. That is how the early Muslims became Muslims. Not because they believe. They know Muhammad much better than they know their own children. He was nothing but a child molester, a sex offender, a prophet pretender, a womanizer, an adulterer, a thief, a killer, a thug, a terrorist. Yes, indeed, a terrorist. And they, because they were afraid of historization in the early days, they became Muslims. And let me share with you the quick story how this all began. If you look with me one more time on the screen. Here we go. The map is said, which we are looking at right now, is the Mecca Medina Quran. The Mecca Medina Islam. The Muslim today in the West and the Muslim five or ten years from now, even here in America. The early Mecca, as you're going to hear, Yusuf, will be quoting you so many of the early Mecca verses, or actually even early Medini verses, because there's a very important doctrine which he himself does not know, the doctrine of abrogation. And I hope and I pray that he will learn today some of these facts, because that will change not only his life on earth, but for eternity. Now, Mecca, the early Mecca verses and the early Medina verses were soft. And that's what Muhammad did for a good 13 years. How many people believed in him? Few. Then he immigrated from Mecca to Medina after the death of his uncle who protected him politically and after the death of his wife who, protect, who supported him financially. And in Medina, Muhammad became a savage, became a terrorist, became, as you see, ISIS today. Came back to Mecca. And then he started practicing the final words of Allah in the Quran. That's why the people said, he's 62 years old. How long do you think he's going to live? Another five years? What do you want, Muhammad? Say the Shahada. Say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. If you don't say it, I'll kill you. So they said it. And guess what? They did not know. When they say it, they entered the mafia life, which means you cannot leave Islam. How do we know it? How do we know that? It's because that is the reality of Islam. You enter, there's no way out. No, some Muslim today will tell you that we don't really believe that ISIS is Islam. And they give you many reasons. I'm going to share with you seven or eight of these reasons today. The first reason they will say is that uh, Islam does not condone the killing of innocent. Now we ask the question, who are the innocent? Because that's not the reality of what innocent is. If you go with me to Quran chapter 5 and verse 72, you read the word of Allah when he said, infidel indeed are those who said, surely Allah is the Christ son of Mary. That is every Christian because all Christians believe Jesus is God. The following verse actually 5, 73 stated, infidel indeed are those who said, surely, surely Allah is the Christ son of Mary. That is every Christian. I mean, we're talking about Orthodox, Catholic, Baptist, name it. All denominations believe in Trinity. And because we are infidels, we are not innocent. So the idea that Muslims do not kill innocent, it's really a joke. Because Muslims have been killing Christians because Christians, for the last 1400 years, because Christians are infidels. Now let's use me the next verse. What do we have here? We actually have a video, a soundbite by Mr. Yusuf himself. I wish you to hear it. I'm sorry I don't have the video to see his picture, but at least you can hear his voice. Here is what Mr. Yusuf said about the next part of our study. 47 verse 4, it says, when you meet in battle, and you know Arabic, Jay, the word for battle in the Quran is harb. Those who reject faith in battle, then it says in that context, smite at their next. But it doesn't stop there. It says, once the hostilities are over, when you have overcome them, there are two conditions. 
You either take them as prisoners and afterwards you set them free, you cannot keep them, or for ransom till the war lays down its burden. Well, that's how Mr. Yusuf represents Quran 47 verse 4. And he will emphasize that he knows what he's talking about. I'm sorry, Mr. Yusuf, you are so ignorant of the Arabic language. You don't even know your own Quran, my friend. The word in battle does not exist in the Quran, my dear friend. You are just reading some dumb English translation given to you by some deceiver like you who led you to believe in that is what is written in the Quran. But here is what is written in the Quran. Watch with me, guys, on the screen, please. Hear what we have here? On the screen, if you don't mind. Watch with me on the screen. What do we have on my screen here? The following. When... So when you meet those who became infidels, so strike the next, that is decapitation, until you have made a great slaughter among them. In Arabic, there is no in battle. That word in battle, some scholars put it between parentheses. But your copy, Mr. Yusuf, it is not in parentheses because they're lying to you. Or you are one of the best deceiver ever came to this world as Muslim. Because the word in battle does not exist in the Arabic text. You lie to, or you are lying to the people in the West because you do not know what you're talking about. Now, I want to move on with our study. Let's read that verses, the verses in the Quran, which Allah mentions the word battle. In Quran chapter 2 and verse 216, if you look with me on the screen here, you read the found verse. Allah said, War is decreed to you, and it is hated by you. And perhaps you may hate something, and it is good for you. And perhaps you may love something, and it's evil for you. And Allah knows, and you do not know. Even the Arab, the Muslim, the early Muslim, hated to kill the Jews and the Christian, and other people who live in their community. But Muhammad assured them by Allah's word that that is what they must do. Now let's continue as we go. The next statement here from the great Muslim scholar al -Tibri. I did not make this up. That is what al -Tibri said. And we read together on the screen the following. He said, I, let's skip the second half. We engage in war with people until they believe in Allah. He who believes in Allah and his messenger has protected his life and possession from us. As for the one who disbelieves, we will engage in war with him forever in the cause of Allah. Killing him is a small matter to us. You know who's speaking here? Not you, some Dak dog. Not some Christian or some Jew or some atheist. That is the great Muslim scholar, Al-Tibri. That is in his interpretation to 79 verses in the Quran. I'm not talking about 7 or 9. No, 79 verses. Allah in the Quran assures the Muslims they have to engage in war. They have to kill. Let me quote you another verse so you get an idea. How they were really practicing these uh, verses. In Quran chapter 9, verse 14, it says the following. Engage in war with them. Allah will torment them by your hands and put them to shame and give you victory over them and heal the chest of a believing people. When Muslims perform jihad, when Muslims kill, and by the way, each and every one of these 79 verses which talk about war has been interpreted by all Muslim scholars, Al-Qurtubi, Al-Tabri, Al-Jalalain, Ibn Kathir, and others, to be holy war. Mr. Yusuf will tell you, holy war does not exist in the Quran. War is all over the Quran, 79 verses. And by the way, he said, this is a Christian uh, uh, words. No, that, this word was never written in the Bible. And the Bible never called Christian to engage in war. But let's move on in our study to watch another. I mean, you're not going to watch. I will, you'll hear it. Video where Mr. Yusuf talking about the no compulsion in religion. Here is what Mr. Yusuf said. According to Islam, Surah 2, verse 256, let there be no compulsion in religion, for truth stands out distinct from falsehood. Now, Jay would argue that this is a passage which is abrogated. But it's quite interesting that this passage is a Medinan surah, which he says is a more authoritative surah. Where does the Quran say that the Prophet Muhammad killed or slay 800 Jews? That passage abrogates other passages. Now, this is a passage he quoted, but he never pointed it out. What does it say? It says, any passage, any message which we are null or consigned to oblivion, we replaced with a better one. Would you perchance ask of the apostle who has been sent to you what was asked aforetime by Moses? But whoever chooses to deny the truth has strayed the right path. 
The word is manansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha. Now the principle laid down is that the Quranic verse abrogates the previous biblical dispensation. It's not <laughs> referring to a verse abrogating one verse. Wow, you were wrong again, Mr. Yusuf. You have no clue what you're talking about. You do not fit with any of the Muslim scholars which we have for the history of Islam. For example, let me share with you some of the verse. First of all, the verse you quoted is a terrible translation. You need to learn Arabic, sir, so you can read the Quran in the Arabic language, so you can read the interpretation of it by its own scholars. You're not a scholar. You're nothing to tell me what is written in the Arabic language. Here what we have. Here is the true English translation. Whatever verse, not passage, whatever verse we abrogate or cause it to be forgotten, we bring a better verse than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has might over all things? It is not the Quran abrogated the Bible. It is the Quran abrogated the Quran. Verses of the Quran has been abrogated by other verses in the Quran. Let me share with you what I'm talking about here. For example, Ibn Abbas said, we're talking about verse abrogated verse, verse remove a verse. Ibn Najih said, An Mujahid, which means what? Another type of abrogation. We will prove that the, Bible, the Quran is right. What is written in the Quran is right. But the judgment of that verse has been abrogated. So, verses in the Quran has been abrogated by being removed, by being forgotten, but we leave the verses in the Quran, but we're not going to practice it anymore because we're going to practice other verses. Let me move on with the next slide. Here we go. Why we have abrogation? You see what's happening here in this next slide? <clears throat> We have the infidels. They were mocking Muhammad and, and his companion. Why? Because Muhammad gave verses and the following day gave other verses. He is contradicting himself. That's why Allah said, and we never we abrogate a verse. We bring a verse better than it or like it. Or if we cause you to forget it, so big deal. We cause you to forget the verse of Allah. We're talking about verses of the Quran. We're not talking about the Quran abrogated other verses. What about Qatada? Qatada said the same thing. Hear what you what Qatada said. Qatada said, He meant, that's what he meant, that there was verses abrogated by other verses. Verses in the Quran abrogated by other verses. Let me move on. The next piece here. What about Sabab, uh, Asbab, uh, why Allah sends these uh, abrogated verses in the Quran? Once again, According to the interpretation, even to Quran, uh, to Quran chapter 16, that's Surah Al-Nahl, verse 101. It says, one more time, the Jews used to mock the Muslims. The Jews used to mock Muhammad because he gave verses, he abrogated with new verses, he was contradicted himself all his life. That's why Allah said, this is my job. Abrogation is in the Quran, my friend, from one verse to another verse. Now I want to move on to Quran chapter 2 and verse 256 which uh, Mr. Yusuf will tell you, it is not abrogated. Like Rafid Deen, no compulsion in religion. Indeed, the right way is made distinct from the error. How about what Ibn Kasir said about that verse? Listen carefully to what Ibn Kasir. As we read together, some of the scholars said that that verse was, gave, was given concerning the people of the book. No compulsion in religion. We're not going to compel the Jews and the Christians. That is before the abrogation and the change. If they pay the jizya. Well, guess what? Even paying the jizya, according to Ibn Kasir here, has been abrogated. Why? Because they have to be killed. Now, listen to this. Others said, That's what I'm saying. Quran 2 to 56 is abrogated by the verses of killing. And and nothing When yajib and yad'u jamia al umam ila dhuul fi din al hanif din Islam. And he must and he must order or ask all the nations to enter to Islam. And is a abba ahad minum ila dhuul is if anyone refused to enter Islam, walam yanqat lahu aw yabzu jizya qutila huwa yaktal. They're gonna engage in war with people who will not accept Islam until he kills them. They engage in war with him until he kills them. And you can go on with many other scarlet inter interpretations. And boy, oh boy, we can go for a long time with all these things. One more time, Al-Tabri, another Muslim scholar, he said what? This verse is abrogated. So what I'm saying here is we can go on for many, many scholars 
who told us that these verses has been abrogated. Here's another one, Al-Qurtubi. This verse is abrogated. Why al qurtubi He said, Because Muhammad force compels the Arab to believe in the religion of Islam, and he did not accept anything from them except Islam. So I got Ibn Kasir, al tabari al qurtubi al jalain all of them said, Quran 2, 256, has been abrogated, and it's abrogated by the killing as Muhammad forced, compelled the Arabs to become Muslims. And Yusuf will tell you that all these scars are wrong. He is the only guy who has the right interpretation of the Quran. And I'm not gonna waste any more time. Let's move on in our presentation here to look at, here is a map of the Muslim world in the first Islamic state. This is exactly what we have here, the map of the first Islamic state, the Saudi Arabia. Notice, the people who believed in Muhammad did not believe in Muhammad. They said, we believed, and Allah corrects them. No, you did not believe. You simply surrendered. And now, they decided to go ahead and leave Islam. And what are they going to do? They're going to apostate, which Mr. Yusuf will tell you, this is not true. Now, listen to this teaching of Mr. Yusuf concerning the apostation. Sir, listen to me. Listen to me. According to the Quran, there's absolutely, and I give you a challenge to to get an alim, I'm not challenging you, I'm seeing you as a brother, but I'm giving a challenge to any non-Muslim orientalist, a Muslim, or any person who has any kind of vendetta against Islam, to give me a single Quranic verse which shows that apostasy is punishable by death in Islam. It was done by one individual. He's challenging me, Mr. Yusuf, that I gave him one verse from the Quran which said that the punishment of apostasy is killing. Well, guess what, Mr. Yusuf? We got the verses of the Quran. Here we go. The first one we read, which is obviously you know, but you're not believing it because you choose to brainwash your own brain to make sure that that's not what it's written. It's written in English. So if they turn away, so seize them and kill them wherever you find them. May you think I made this up? No. Let me give you your own scars interpretation. al tabrim If these people, the hypocrite, change their mind, do you want to believe in Allah and his messenger? If they did not immigrate from the house of uh, policies to the house of peace, from the infidelity to Islam, so take them, O you believer, and kill them wherever you find them. In their cities and in other places, and in other cities, I asabtumuhum min ardullah mean kill them anywhere in the land of Allah. That is what the great Muslim scholar Al Tabri said. Now, Muslim will tell you that they believe, actually, if you look here with me in the next slide here, that uh, here we go. <clears throat> if I can get the slide to show on the screen, that Muslim may make peace with the people of war if it was good for the Muslim. Is a kana fil muada'a maslaha lil muslimin. What if it's not good for the Muslim? They will not have peace with them. Al fitna akbaru min qatal. Sedition is great, is greater than killing. Listen to what Allah said in Quran chapter 2, verse 217. And whoever apostate among you from his religion, so he is put to death as an infidel. Here is the interpretation. As Shafi said, and now yuqtal, he must be killed. لِقَوْلِهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Because of the saying of Muhammad, peace be on him, مَنْ بَدَّلَ دِينُهُ فَاقْتُلُوهُ Whoever changed his religion, so kill him. Let me give you another verse, Mr. Yusuf, in case you don't have enough. Quran chapter 6, verse 151, which is amazingly, was repeated in the Quran chapter 17, 33, and Quran chapter 25, verse 68, where Allah said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسِ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ الله إلا بالحق. And do not kill the soul, which Allah forbids, except with a just cause. Do you know what is the just cause? Let's see what Al Tabri said. We read together. Here, Al Tabri said, And taqtun nafsan, a soul killed a soul, or tazni, a soul commit adultery, or tertad an dinaha al haq fatuqtal, or a soul that leave the religion of truth, so it must be killed. Let me give you what Muhammad said in Sahih Muslim. Uh, as, as actually written here by Bukhari, he said, Muhammad said, the blood of the Muslim cannot be shed except in three cases, for murder, adultery, and the one who apostate 
leave Islam. So I quote you, many of your Muslim scholars, if I have three, four hours, I can quote you weeks of, of reading from your scholars that every Muslim who leave Islam must be put to death. Now we know about the war of apostasy. The biggest history they taught me in Egypt, the war of apostasy, the day Muhammad died, many of the Muslims left Islam and we start fighting each other. First civil war, Muslims killing the Muslims who left Islam. Thousands were killed. And it ended by Muslim being victorious as they were able to take over the Saudi Arabia Peninsula, the first Islamic State, and then the 12 armies which Muhammad left in Saudi Arabia expanded their territory, taking over all these countries you see on the board. Now, how many of the Egyptians believe in Islam? None. How many of the Turkish believe in Islam? None. How many of the Iraqi believe in Islam? None. How, be, how many of any of these countries seen on the map believe in Islam? None. Why? Because these people could not have a copy of the Quran. They never read the Quran. They never heard of Muhammad. They never saw Muhammad. They were simply killed by the age of the sword. And their wives and their daughters were raped by the Muslims. And they became the early ancestors of the Muslim in the Muslim world. 57 Muslim countries. Until today. 87% of the Muslim people around the world cannot read the Quran Arabic, including my debater here, Mr. Yusuf. He memorized verses of the Quran, as his boss, uh, Ahmed Didat and others, memorized verses of the Quran. And I would challenge you, if you will say a word in Arabic in the end of this debate, I will turn this debate to Arabic and I will expose you to the world, as now people watching us all over the world, you do not even speak Arabic. Or you are a professional liar, because you added words to the Quran does not exist in the text. So, let's move on to our study, as we have no much time. What is the goal for the Muslim? What they're hoping to accomplish? It is to take over the entire world as you see it on that map. Now I'd like to play with you another video from Mr. Yusuf. Listen carefully to what he says. You quote Surah 9 verse 5. When you quote Surah 8 verse 60, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. I have yet to come across one person in all my discussions that can be able to form and justify any form of unprovoked aggression from the Quranic perspective. Well, you're a happy man today, Mr. Yusuf, because now you can talk with me. Yes, indeed. I'm the first man who was going to show you that you are not right. First of all, let's look at 9.5. Here's the verse which Mr. Yusuf said, oh, everybody use it to make Islam look bad. No. The word said, when you, when, so when the forbidden months are passed, so kill the polytheists wherever you find them, and take them as captive, and besiege them, and lay wait for them with every kind of ambush. So if they repent, that's convert to Islam, and perform the prayer, and give the legal alms, so leave their way free, surely Allah is forgiven, merciful. Let me tell you a little bit more about that verse. Here we go, as we change the screen. Mr. Yusuf come up with two sets of people, he said, there are two tribes, Bani Damra and Bani Kanana. Those people were good. They did not break the covenant. Therefore, the Muhammad did not engage in war with them. But other people, the pagans, those are the ones who really want to hear the Quran. They want to learn about the Quran. Quran 9, chapter 9, verse 6. Muhammad also did not engage in war with them. You know, I have two problems here, Mr. Yusuf. The first problem, even Bani Kanana and Bani Dharma, you're talking about, the only were allowed to live until the end of their agreement. Muhammad never make real peace with anybody. He always tie his peace with a limited time. As when he did the peace with Bani Quraysh, he make it 14 years. He didn't even keep the 10 years. He broke it because Allah in 9, uh, Quran chapter 9, verse 1, he said, we're innocent from that covenant. So even these people were forced into Islam or killed. How about the one who want to hear the Quran? Quran chapter 9, verse 6. Let me read to you what Allah said in Quran Chapter 9, verse 6, so you know what we're talking about. Here we go. We have five and minutes if left. if anyone of the policies ask you for a shelter, so give to him a shelter until he hears the word of Allah, then let him reach his place of safety. This is because there are people who do not understand. Listen to the interpretation of these words by Muslim scholar. وَاخْتَلَفَ فِي حُكْمِ الْآيَةِ Muslim scholars disagree. I love it. Muslim scholars always disagree. And they said, listen to this. Ahmed ibn Ishaq said, the Sana Abu Ahmed said, the Sana Sufyan, and then the rest of the name go. This verse is mansukha. Can you imagine with me? Quran chapter 9, verse 6 is mansukh. It is abrogated by the verse before it, Quran chapter 9, verse 5. And don't be surprised, there are plenty of Medini verses abrogated by the following verse or the previous verse in the Quran. It's amazing. It's a mystery. 
Maybe in the future we can do debate about abrogation so we can teach Yusuf some truths about Islam. How it is abrogated with all these cards? They said it was abrogated, kills the policy, the policies wherever you find them. Also, uh, we have abrogation 47.4. And you can go on and on and on about all Muslim scholars who tell us that even Quran chapter 9 verse 6 has been abrogated with the Quran 9 5, which is the previous verse. Now, watch one more piece or listen to one more piece from Mr. Yusuf. He said, And what are we as Muslims to do in re reclaiming our faith from people who don't even have a basic understanding of the Quran? O Surul Fiqh or Asbab al-Nuzul, or the basic interpretation of the Quranic text itself. What's our role? We need to speak up, but not from the perspective of taking an us and them approach, but seeing the bigger picture, maybe sometimes taking a step back and saying that it's not just clearly black and white, there are shades of gray in between. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Yusuf, it is black and white. You cannot put different shades of gray in the Quran. Allah's word is clear. Allah's, Allah's word is very clear, very uh, understood by Allah's own testimony in the Quran. He did not say, it is up to Yusuf to put some different shades in the verses. It is clear. You cannot tell this to the 600 million who has been killed by your early Muslim fathers, even until today. Do you know that every hour, six Christians is killed by Muslims all over the world? In that debate, at least between 12 to 18, depending on how long we're going to go in the debate, 18 Christians will be killed in these three hours coming up. This is the reality of Islam. It is black and white. Allah said, kill them, and you say, no, we don't believe in kills them. You know what's going to happen here in the West? People like you, Mr. Yusuf, deceive the naive, the liberal, the ignorant, the democrat of the West, like here in America, and makes them believe that there are two different kinds of Islam, loving Islam and wicked Islam. No, it is only one wicked Islam. It is the Islam of the Quran and its interpretation by a Muslim scholar and its teaching and practice by Muhammad, the self-proclaimed prophet of Islam. This is the reality of Islam. There is no different colors in Islam. There is no shades in Islam. In Islam. Let me quote you 929, a verse which Mr. Yusuf will also tell you that he does not really believe that verse says what it says. Here is the word of Allah. Allah said, Engage in war with those who do not believe in Allah and in the last day, and do not forbid what Allah and His Messenger forbid, and do not believe in the religion of truth among those who have been given the book, that's Jews and the Christian, and tell the base jizya out of hand, and they are subdued, and they are humiliated. I love it how Mr. Yusuf will tell you, we need to know Asbab and Nuzul. You cannot just read verses from the Quran. Well, guess what? I got Asbab and Nuzul for you here, sir. Here we go. We have to go back to Quran verse 28. If you can see it on the screen, it will be good. Allah said here, we have one minute. Asbab in Nizul is this. Quran chapter 928. Oh, you have believed. And then Allah said, and if you were afraid of coming to poverty, so Allah will enrich you from his bounty if he wills. And guess what? How Allah is going to enrich him. See, the Muslims were afraid. The market, the traveling, the selling and buying of goods will stop because Muhammad said no more policies can come to Saudi Arabia. No more of the infidels can come to Saudi Arabia. I'm going to get rid of the Jews. I'm going to get rid of the Christians. Well, guess what? They were afraid about their income. And Allah said, no, you will take the jizya from the Jews and the Christians. You will be rich. You're going to force them to Islam. You're going to engage in war with them. You're going to force them to Islam. Or you will take jizya from them. And don't worry about losing your income, losing your money. Here is Asbab and Nizul, Mr. Yusuf, for 929. Islam is a savage called kill and destroy Jews and the Christians and others all over Saudi Arabia and all over the world. Yusuf, you have 30 minutes to respond. You can make your opening statement now. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I want to basically ask Allah, the one and only God, not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, not any other false God, to allow me to combat the kind of falsehood and propaganda that I see. Now, at the outset, before I delve into the topic, I must state that I'm literally gobsmacked by the amount of lies, propaganda, and falsehood that Osama Dagdog packed in a period of 30 minutes. And I think this would give me a wonderful opportunity to be able to confront his falsehood and, of course, challenge his warped position. I don't know. He accuses me of not being able to speak Arabic. Yes, I cannot speak Arabic. I'm proudly saying I cannot converse in Arabic. I can read the Arabic Quran. I can paraphrase the Arabic text, but I cannot speak Arabic. But looking at your analysis as an Arabic speaker, if your Arabic is as bad as your English, sir, I'm not surprised that you probably come to the kind of warped conclusions that you basically came to. And we're going to basically focus on that. 
Now, at the outset, I must say that if you were an atheist, if you were an agnostic and you were to basically provide a critique on me, I would basically be uh, willing to listen to your critique. But the position you come from betrays a duplicitous double standard in that the same particular line of attack that you have basically engaged in can be used tenfold against you. I mean, at the outset, for example, we had a week ago the attack in London. He killed four people. Now we are told that this individual had absolutely no connection to ISIS. He was visiting prostitutes. He was taking drugs. But in the same time in Mosul, more than 200 people were killed by your government. Your government killed 200 people. And what did you say about that? You said absolutely nothing. Evangelists were quiet. What about this? If you talk about the violence that is contained in the Quran in Islam, what do you say about the fact that in Numbers 31 verse 17, you've got sex slavery and the institutionalization of gang rape, allegedly by Yahweh in the Old Testament? Genocide. Genocide by Jesus at the end times when he comes. So I'm saying let's not maintain a double standard and let's, of course, try and take a step back and look at position from a more moderate, decent perspective, as opposed to just engaging in this kind of gutter level polemics. If you want to engage in gutter polemics, Mr. Dagdog, I can do the same. We can engage in gutter polemics and create more confusion and confuses the masses out there. And I don't think you've dealt with the topic. You've focused, you've jumped with a lot of my past presentations, but you haven't stuck to the topic. The topic was, um, is ISIS representative of Islam? You've provided absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing in your discussion. And the question I need to do is let's go back to the topic and we need to determine are ISIS recruits motivated by the religious faith? Now, I'm going to divide this discussion into two particular uh, types of presentations. The one is, is that I'm going to focus on the political aspect. And of course, then I'm going to delve into the religious element. Let's look at an individual called Mark Sageman. He's a Polish-born psychiatrist. He's 61 years old. He worked with the Mujahideen in the 1980s in Afghanistan, and he's advised the New York City Police Department on counterterrorism, 9-11, a whole lot of other issues. When he was questioned, does he see religion as a prism through which we view the rise of ISIS? This is what he says. He says, religion has a role, but it's a role of justification. It's not why they do this or why young people do that. He says, ISIS members are using religion to advance a political vision rather than using politics to advance a religious vision. So to give themselves some degree of legitimacy, they use Islam as a justification. Now, look at this. Do you know ISIS and their views and their particular position, they would be on the same platform as you, Islamah Dagdog. You know that? They would be on the very same platform as you because you are a Christian extremist. And so you would obviously... Uh, justify and amplify and advance their specific agenda. And you need to ask yourself, what's your motive and what's your motives of Randy? Um, one could basically go on. He says, you don't have the most religious folks going there. A large number of these particular individuals tend to be teenagers. They tend to be convert, angry, bored young men. And let's look at the example. I'll give you a few examples and then we can go into our topic. The ISIS executioner, Mohammed Wazi, you heard of him? Jihadi John, he was raised and educated in the United Kingdom. Two British medics who met him described him as an adrenaline junkie. He went to Africa on drinking expeditions with his German friend immediately before joining ISIS. Mohammed As uh, Ahmed and Yusuf Sarwar, they were two young British men from Birmingham. And before joining ISIS, they ordered via Amazon a book called Islam for Dummies and the Quran for Dummies. Now, if these are the individuals that are basically joining ISIS. What we can effectively see is that these people are particularly religious novices. Didier Francois, you've heard of him, Osama? He's a French journalist who was held by ISIS in Syria for 10 months before being released in 2014. He did an interview with Christian Amanpour. He spent 14 months with ISIS, 10 months with ISIS, not unlike you. And when questioned what motivated them, this is what he said. He said, there was never really a discussion about texts. He says it was not a religious discussion. It was more a hammering what they believed than teaching us about the Quran because it had nothing to do with the Quran. He went on further to say they didn't even have the Quran. They didn't even want to give us the Quran. Now, what does this tell you? And I think it's important. We can discuss the issue of peace and violence in the Quran and the Bible. But the topic was, does ISIS represent the teachings of Islam? And are the people joining ISIS, are they in fact motivated by Islam? And I'm presenting you reasons and you've never even touched the particular topic and I wonder why. In 2008 there was a classified briefing on radicalization prepared by MFI's Behavioral Science Unit and they stated far from being religious zealots a large number of those involved in terrorism do not practice their faith regularly. They're involved in drug taking, drinking alcohol, visiting prostitutes. A well-established religious identity this report says actually protects against violent radicalization. Lastly 
In his book, The Black Banners, Inside Story of 9-11 and Al-Qaeda, Lebanese-American Ali H. Sufan, he conducted interviews. And when he said, and I'll give you the quote, when I first began interrogating Al-Qaeda members, I found that while they could quote bin Laden's sayings by heart, I knew far more of the Quran than they did. And in fact, some barely knew classical Arabic, the language of both the Hadith and the Quran. So if you want to quote the Quran, fight the unbelievers, but you leave out the portion, fight those who fight against you. So, for example, if I were to say fight Usama Dagdok, I'm atomizing it and quoting out of context. But if I were to say fight Usama Dagdok, if he attempts to rape your mother and son, then I'm providing the context. Now, can you see the question I need to ask is why do you play this game? Why do you atomize scripture? Certainly there's a context. And we're going to deal with some of the verses that you basically point if the uh, particular time allows it. One last point is that in ISIS today, there is a alliance led by Baghdadi and the remnants of uh, Saddam Hussein's secular Baathist regime. Now, this is a question. The Baathists were secular Arab nationalists. Are you aware of that, sir? Are you aware that they were secular Arab nationalists? Yet you find in many studies conducted by people like Wood and so on, a lot of the deputies of ISIS happened to be ex baathists Now, what, what, what caused the transition? Did they suddenly believe that it was Islam that basically inspired them to work under Baghdadi? Or what was it? So I think we need to take a step back and see the political element. The Baathist element is very important, and certainly the um, uh, context behind what you see is extremely important. Now, coming to the discussion on whether there's any religious justification. This is my point I would raise to Sama, and I'd quote um, Philip Jenkins, that if Christians or Jews needed biblical text to justify deeds of mass slaughter or terrorism, the main problem would be an embarrassment of riches. If someone looking for the next best text to justify suicide terrorism, the Quran offers nothing explicit besides general exhortations to war. And I don't deny that. There are passages of war in the Quran, Osama, but you need to basically look at the context. For example, I know I'm just skipping and jumping through the presentation. You said that I misquoted Surah 47 verse 4. There is no word of harb. I don't know Arabic. Yes, I don't know Arabic, but I need to ask, do you know Arabic as an Arab scholar? This is what it says. What does that mean? What does that mean in Surah 47 verse 4? Till the war lays down its burdens. Now, in the context of Surah 47 verse 4, what I mean is when you meet the unbelievers in fight, is it just meeting them on the street, meeting them in the Shabin, meeting them on the uh, beachfront? It's in the context of warfare, because why would the Quran say it uses the word harb? So can you see the lies by Osama where he says there's no harb in the verse? This is a man who goes on air and says that every Muslim is a demon. This is a man who says that Barack Obama is a Muslim. This is a man that says that every Muslim is demon possessed. What do you expect from some particular individual that will come with this particular type of lie? So harb is in fact in the verse. I don't know why you try to twist it. I may not know Arabic as well as you conversationally, but I'm now beginning to wonder, is your Arabic as bad as your English? Now, when you look at the particular text of the Quran, there are certain procedures you need to follow. And I raise this in all my debates. Number one, you need to look at the text. You need to look at the context. So, for example, Numbers 31 verse 17 in the Bible. Now, therefore, kill all the boys and kill all the girls, but keep alive for yourself all the young girls who are virgins for sex. For what? How does a soldier in the field verify whether a woman is a virgin or not? Now, a Christian may argue, let's look at the context. Well, why is it that you want to look at the context when it comes to the Bible, but you refuse to look at the context when it comes to the Quran? So we need to distinguish between the Quran and also secondary source material and what people may say later. Now, you raised some point, and I see time is running out so quickly. You said that I misread Surah Baqarah. Chapter 2, verse 106, that any ayah which we are now consigned to oblivion. However, the vast majority of contemporary scholars, for example, I've got this translation here by Muhammad Hassan. He lived with Bedouins. Do you know him? And Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali. And many scholars would argue that a better translation of this particular verse is any message which we annul or consign to oblivion, we replace with a better one. Would you perchance ask of the apostle who has been sent to you what was asked aforetime of Moses? So can you see the mention of Moses there? But whoever chooses to deny the truth, it has already strayed from the path. Now, what Muhammad Asad points out, that if we read this verse with the previous one, which states that Jews and Christians refuse to accept any revelation which might supersede that of the Bible, for in that way, abrogation relates to the earlier divine message. 
and not to any part of the Quran itself. Because if the abrogation applied to Quranic verses, then why is it in the Quran we do not have a single verse which says this verse has been abrogated, nor do we have a hadith. We don't have anything in the traditions. What you do have is probably writings by Ibn Kathir or Tabri. Ibn Kathir came when? 700 years later. Do you know that? 700 years later. So you're relying on him when he suits your particular agenda. But what about the internal texts of the Quran? Is there anything in the Quran which says such a verse is now replaced with another verse? And I don't think there's a scholarly consensus on that particular verse. And this is an example I'll give you. The example of abrogation in Surah 5, verse 47, where it applies to previous biblical dispensation. The Lex Talionis, it is we who reveal the law to Moses. We ordain therein life for life, eye for eye, nose for nose, ear for ear, tooth for tooth, and wounds equal for equal. The Lex Talionis. But then it goes on to say, but now if anyone remits a retaliation by way of charity, it is an act of atonement in itself. And if any fail to judge by the light which we have revealed, they are no better than wrongdoers. So can you see abrogation of the previous biblical dispensation? A classic example in that. What about Surah 16, verse 101? Surah 16, verse 101 is also cited as a verse which is viewed as indicating abrogation. But this verse is a Meccan surah, not a Medina surah. So why is it that the polemicists who cite Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 101, referring to abrogation, when abrogation is supposedly supposed to take place in Medina, and this verse details his uh, position in Medina, but Surah 16, which speaks about the abrogation, is a Meccan Surah. Surah 2, verse 106, and the preceding verses, in fact, address the Jews. So I think it's important that you need to take a step aside and basically um, see things in a far more broader perspective. Does ISIS follow the following injunctions? For example, Surah 8, verse 61, Surah Anfal. This is basically the Surah, the spoils of war. What does it say? It says, in Janahu, Lisilmi, Fajnahlaha, Watawakal Allah, in Nahu Huasimul Alim. If the enemy incline towards peace, to thou also incline towards peace, and trust in Allah, for he is the one that heareth and knoweth all things. So can you see in the context of warfare, if the enemy incline towards peace? Now that's a Medina surah, that's a later surah, that's an injunction of warfare. But look what it says. Go on. If they incline to peace, you should also incline to it. Again, Surah 4, verse 90. You know, you quoted Surah 4, verse 89 as referring to the verse about apostasy. But what does it say? It says, subsequent to Surah 4, verse 89, yasiluna ila bainakum wa bainahum mithaq, Except those who join a group between you and whom there is a treaty or those who approach you with their hearts restraining from you from fighting. And what does it say on? It says if they withdraw from you and fight not against you and offer you peace, then Allah open no way for you against them. Now the question, Mr. Dagdog, what part of that verse didn't you understand? You quoted Surah 4 verse 89. Why didn't you finish it with Surah 4 verse 90? Did Surah 4 verse 90 abrogate Surah 4 verse 89? Can you see the double standard and the game that is being played here, Osama? Does it make sense to you? That's your tongue. It's not my mother tongue. It's your tongue. Why don't you finish the verse? Again, Surah 2, verse 208. Now, the grammarian as a judge stated that in this Medina Surah, Surah Baqarah, this was the only time where contemporary scholars or subsequent scholars translated the word Silm as Islam. But in actual fact, the translation should be, oh, you believe, enter absolutely into peace completely. Do not follow in the footsteps of Satan. Now, the word is Silm. If it was Islam, it would have said, But here it says Silm, which means enter absolutely into peace. So in that particular verse, you'd see that Islam calls for a uh, peace, fosters a life in sincerity and honesty before God. And in fact, you find that no one can be compelled to live by Islamic morals. Now, I do understand that Usama Dagdok, I quoted Surah 2 verse 256 in the previous lecture, like Rafi Din Qattabayn Rushd al and he gave the indication that this verse is abrogated. Am I correct? That that verse now no longer applies. Let's go by the same warped argument that you are presenting. Then I need to ask you, what about Surah 22 verse 67? 
Surah 22 verse 67 came much, much later. It's a Medina Surah. And what does it say? It says, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْ هُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ فَلَا يُنَازِعُنَّكَ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَدُوِ لَا رَبِّكَ إِنَّكَ لَعَلَى هُدًا مُسْتَقِيمٌ لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْ هُمْ نَاسِكُوهُ You cannot compel. You cannot compel those you would like to Islam. That is to guidance. But Allah guides as he wills. He has the best of knowledge of those guided. So let's assume we go on the idea that Surah 2 verse 256 is abrogated and night no longer applying. Well, what about Surah 22 verse 67? Is that abrogated? So it's convenient, Usama, that according to your game and spin that you're basically presenting here, and in fact, the propaganda, it's clearly propaganda, vicious lies. It seems to me that all the verses of the Quran that speak about peace, that speak about good neighborliness is all abrogated. There's nothing good. And yet Surah 22 verse 67 applies much, much later. Don't be a hypocrite, my brother. You're a good man, but you unfortunately, and, and you're supposed to know Arabic. But like I said, if your Arabic is as bad as your English or your understanding of Arabic is as bad as your English, I'm not surprised that you're coming to these particular type of conclusions. So we can throw away Surah 2 verse 256. Let me assume I'm going with your understanding. What do you say about Surah 22 verse 67? Are you now going to say, oh, that's also abrogated. Are you going to say that? Come on, let's maintain some degree of decency. Look at ISIS, some of the practices of ISIS. ISIS kills people that they consider leaving the so-called Islamic State. Do we have any such passage like that in the Quran? Well, let's look at the passages in the Quran. Surah Nisa, chapter 3, verse 89. I'm going to paraphrase it. Those who believe after their believing, thereafter increasing their disbelief, their repentance shall not be accepted, and they are they that go astray. So how can you believe and then increase in your disbelief if in fact the death penalty is to be imposed on you for apostasy, because once you disbelieve, you're going to be killed. Am I correct? So how can they increase in their disbelief? <laughs> um, and then in Surah 3 verse 71, a party of the people of the book, the Jews say, believe in what has been revealed to you in the day and then apostatize later in the afternoon so that the Muslims will see you and they'll also apostatize. Now, here's a question. Surah 3 verse 71 is a Medina Surah, right? It's not been abrogated. Unless you can show me now, this has also been abrogated. Every verse which I'm showing you is abrogated. But such a plan would have been impossible if apostasy was in fact punishable by death. So who does ISIS follow? Do they follow the Hadith? Or do they follow maybe the Bible? Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 5. It says the prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. If your brother, your son, your mother, your daughter, your wife says, let us go and serve other gods which have not known, nor thy fathers, then thou shalt not consent him. Thou shalt not hearken him. Thou shalt not pity him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 8 to 9. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 15. Thou shalt murder the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. Murder them. Commandment by Yahweh, which means Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All of them together, destroying it utterly and all that is in therein, and the cattle with the edge of the sword. So those severe laws commanded the members of the Hebrew religion to murder even if their own children, if they do not worship Yahweh. Now the Bible, the biblical words to a fanatical extremist, basically imbibes the killing of family friends because they fail to change their beliefs. Now, obviously, you may argue, well, this doesn't bind you. This doesn't basically apply to you. I am a Christian. I follow the New Testament. Well, it's quite interesting. That in the context of the Old Testament, Yahweh did, in fact, impose these particular laws. And if on the assumption that you have in the juristic interpretation of the Islam and in Fiki legislation, aspects of the death penalty for apostasy, well, why are you critiquing it? Why I can critique it because I have a particular perspective. Why are you critiquing it when there's more vicious passages in your own book? Can you see the double standard there? Rape of women. ISIS engages in rape of women. Do we agree about that? ISIS engages in rape of women. And, and, and Usama in his lectures have gone on to say that Islam, in fact, allows the rape of women. It promotes the rape of women. Well, do you know what the word for rape in Arabic is? I don't know Arabic. Do you know what the word for rape is? It's ahtisab. Am I correct? Ahtisab is a word for rape in Arabic. Yet you find in the Quran that verse is non-existent. In the Hadith literature, that verse is non-existent. Yet get yourself a copy of the Arabic Bible, and I will show you where the word ihtisab appears numerous times, numerous times. For example, Deuteronomy 22 verse 28, if a man finds a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lays hold of her and rapes her, then the man shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver. Because he has raped her, he may not put her away as his wife. Can you imagine that the penalty for a rapist is that he has to marry his rape victim. What kind of a just law is that? By Yahweh? By God? By the Holy Ghost? 
What about Judges chapter 19, verse 24 to 25? There you find that it describes a father who offers his virgin daughter to a drunken mob. When the father says, do not do such a vile thing to this uh, uh, individual, but here are my daughter and here are my concubine. And verse 25 describes the hour-long gang rape of the poor concubine. And the Bible does not give one hint of compassion for the raped girl. But what does Islam say? This, the Prophet in Jamia Tirmidhi, in the chapter of the narration, you see that a woman went out during the time of the Prophet to go to Salat, but she was caught by a man and he had relations with her and she screamed and he left. Then the man, had, uh, the man came across her and she said, this man had done this to me and that man did this to me. And they brought the man to the Prophet They brought him to the messenger of Allah and he ordered that the man be stoned and he told the woman to go away. It's in Jamia Tirmidhi, volume three, book number 15, hadith number 1454. The hadith is Hassan. It's basically the, the rapist was stoned to death. In the Bible, you find the rapist is forced to marry the rape victim. What kind of double standards and duplicity? So if you are talking about ISIS, you want to split hairs about ISIS, well, who are they following? Are they following the Quran? Are they following the Hadith? Or are they following your own biblical laws? Do some particular research. And it's important, Osama, and I say this with love to you, my dear brother, you need to keep up with the latest research. You need to basically keep yourself aware of these particular passages. Kindness toward people. Uh, the Quran says that it is not righteousness that you turn your faces towards the east or the west, but righteous is who believes in Allah, the last day, the angels, the books, the prophet, and spend his money for the love of him on the kindred and the orphans and the needy and the wayfarer. And more importantly, the word in Arabic is wasailina wa fi riqab. What does raqaba mean? This is your language. It's your mother tongue. What does it mean? It means ransoming of slaves or liberating slaves, depending how you want to look at it. <laughs> now we come to the perspective of jihad, and I know that people appropriate the context of jihad and they understand it in many contexts and many understandings. And in the past, I've mentioned that the word for holy war in Arabic is in fact al-harb al-muqaddasatu. It does mean holy war. Jihad literally means a struggle. Now, there are different contexts of jihad. For example, non-violent struggling within oneself for a life of virtue, that's jihad. Saying the truth, even if it's against one's own interests, that's jihad. And physical combat, in other words, physical fighting to establish justice which is a supreme goal, that's also jihad. So jihad could mean many things. In fact, if you translated the Quran, I don't know if you did, but if you did or claim to do it, you would note that the Quran uses the word jihad generically. For example, Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 15. In that context, it speaks about non-Muslim mushrikeen engaging in duress. And the word used is jihada, which is a root word for jihad. So Muslims can engage in jihad, non-Muslims can engage in jihad. You obviously need to look at the context in terms of how this particular verse is viewed. The Quran and prophetic sayings insist not to harm and orders Muslims to strongly treat non-Muslims with kindness and justice. And why do I say this? Surah Al-Mumtahana, chapter 60, verse 8 to 9, it says, Allah does not forbid you with regards to those who do not fight you on account of your religion, nor drive you out of your homes to treat them with goodness and to be just to them. Now again, Usama, I need to ask you, what part of that verse didn't you understand? Is that now abrogated? Is that now no longer applicable? Did Surah 9 verse 5 just come and abrogate this totally? What kind of nonsense is this? What nonsense is this? This is a Medina Surah. It's a late Medina Surah. And effectively, it's speaking about the effective uh, times of warfare, that those who do not fight you on account of your religion, nor drive you out, treat them with goodness. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, if anyone wrongs or does injustice to a dhimmi, I am an advocate against him till the day of judgment. Now, in what context is fighting allowed? In what context? I'm going to rush now because time is at a premium. The very first verse that detailed fighting was Surah 22, verse 39 to 40. And what does it say? It says permission is only given to those on whom war is being waged or under attack in parenthesis, but whom war is being waged because they are oppressed. And surely yeah, Allah is minutes. able to assist them, those who are driven from their homes without a just cause, except that they say our Lord is God. That's the very first verse that relates to defense of fighting in the Quran. The second verse, very famous, Second verse, which relates to defense of fighting in the Quran, and I'm going to read it out to you so I don't basically seem to be saying something else. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Fight in the cause of God, those who fight you. 
But Allah loves not transgressors. In Allah, like, do not transgress and slay them out wherever they slay, catch out and turn them out from where they catch out. For tumult and oppression is worse than slaughter. But it says importantly, But if they cease, God is of forgiving, most merciful. Now, is that also abrogated, Osama? Strangely enough, this verse speaks about fighting. It lays down the rule of fighting. Is that verse abrogated? Can you see the double standard that you're engaging in them and the atom is atomization that you're engaging? Surah 4 verse 75. Why should you not fight in the cause of God and of the utterly oppressed men, women and children who are crying? Our sustainer lead us forth to freedom out of a land whose people are tyrants and raise for us out of thy grace. One who will bring us liberation. Surah Nisa, chapter 4 verse 75. Again, is that abrogated as well? So what you have to do is engage in what I would call the cherry picking fallacy. The cut and paste syndrome, fight unbelievers, terrify the enemies of God, slay the unbelievers, fight Jews and Christians, cut the heads of the infidels. But when I open these particular verses, I see something else. Now, I don't know if we have time to basically go into this, but let's look at quickly Surah 9 verse 5. I may have to deal with it in the rebuttal in detail. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters where you find them and lie and wait for them and besiege them. But why is it that you never quote Surah 9 verse one to four. Why, do, why is that never quoted? Surah 9 verse 1 says, this is a declaration of disassociation from Allah and his messenger to those whom you made a treaty amongst the polytheists. Does that make sense to you? Verse 3, and it is announcement from Allah to the people on the day of greater pilgrimage that Allah disassociates from the disbelievers. So if you repent that is best for you, uh, then know that you will not cause failure. Verse 4, accept. What does accept mean? Now let's go to Surah 9, verse 5. What does Surah 9, verse 5, verse 4 basically say? Does it mean anything to you, Sama? Surah 9, verse 4 says, Those treaties not dissolved with those pagans whom you have entered into a mutual alliance and failed not against you, nor aided once against you, you fulfill it to the end. And then verse 5 is those particular pagans who broke their treaties. Now let's look at this. Let's assume, let's assume that this basically applies to everybody. Well, what about Surah 9 verse 13? Surah 9 verse 13 says, Will you not fight people who violated their oaths, plotted to expel the apostle, and took the first and the aggressive by attacking you? Do you fear them? Nay, it is Allah whom you should fear, more justly if you believe. Fight them and Allah will punish them by your hands. Again, those particular pagans. And then again in verse 7, what does verse 7 say? How can there be a league be before Allah and his apostle with the pagans? Meaning those pagans in Surah 9 verse 5. Except those with whom you made a, pre a peace treaty near the sacred mosque. As long as these stand true to you, you stand true to them. So now I need to understand. I mean, are you confused, Osama? You claim to have translated the Quran. You claim to have translated it. What part do you not understand? Surah 9 discusses a peace treaty with the Muslims entered in the pagans. The pagans were repeatedly breaking the left. treaty. One minute. God, Allah, declares an immunity from treaties. And he basically says two pagan tribes adhered. And in that particular context, it in fact refers to them. So I think it's important from the perspective of what we are presenting and what's being seen that Usama has basically twisted, atomized, and changed the entire context. Let's look at the historical perspective. Indonesia, the largest and most important Islamic organization has issued a fatwa against ISIS. More than 100 world scholars have issued a fatwa against ISIS. Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Afifi al akiti wrote a fatwa against ISIS. Al-Azhar has issued a fatwa against ISIS, calling it the enemy. Sheikh Tahir al-Qadir has issued a 600-page fatwa condemning ISIS. The Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar has declared ISIS illegitimate. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Yasser Qadi has declared ISIS as illegitimate. So it seems that only Usama Dagdog is correct with his false, uh, corrupt, and distorted interpretations. Let's take, take a step back. Don't atomize scripture. Don't take it out of context. I wish you the best of luck. I know you've got 10 minutes, and uh, I hope you'll basically be able to deal with this in the limited time period that you've got. Good luck. We have to take a break here. Is ISIS a true representation of Islam? We're going to continue the discussion when we get back after this break. Stay tuned. And welcome back to ABN and the Trinity Channel. We're discussing, if you're just tuning in with us, is ISIS a true representation of Islam? To answer that question, we have with us Yusuf Ismail, as well as Usama Dagduk. We're going to go now to Usama Dagduk. He has 10 minutes to rebuttal Yusuf's reply. Usama, go ahead. 
Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. First of all, we're not talking about Deuteronomy or USA, America. We're talking about ISIS. Stick with ISIS. Uh, yes, political and religion are mixed in Islam. You cannot separate political from religion Islam. Yes, they are killing verses in the Quran where you see it. It's defensive war. But the final word, the final word of Allah is offensive war. Uh, I do not know which part you don't understand of that. Uh, so we know that Muslims, when they come to the West, they are very wonderful, very peaceful. They actually practice Quran chapter 47, verse 35, where it said, do not call for peace. Do not be weak. Call for peace when you have the upper hand. If you want to learn about Muhammad, let me tell you what Muhammad said. It says, I descended by Allah with the sword in my hand, and my wealth will come from the shadow of my sword, and the one who will disagree with me will be humiliated and persecuted. This is the words of your prophet Muhammad. You are practicing taqiyya, my dear, my dear friend, Mr. Yusuf. That is Quran chapter 3, verse 28, where you read about Muslims are not supposed to take Jews and Christians for friends. They're, supposed to not, they're not supposed to take any infidel for friends, except, here is the exception, that you should guard yourself from them cautiously. The interpretation of the great Muslim scholar al Jalalain. If you are afraid of them, you can take them as friend. Bilisan do not call by your tongue, not with your heart. And that is before the might of Islam. And this can be practiced to whoever live in a country is not strong in it. As do not be weak, call for peace when you have the upper hand. Quran 47, verse 35. The interpretation of the great Muslim scholar Ibn Kasir. If you are afraid, I'm sorry, if you are weak, you can call people for peace, as Muhammad did with Bani Quraysh. He uh, accepted their agreement to have peace with them. But if you have strength and you have a large number of Lebanon people, fight them. That is the reality of what's going on with these verses in the Quran. Yes, there are verses say offense, defensive war, but the final word of Allah is offensive war. Uh, you argue with me. Why you argue with me? Why didn't you argue with Ibn Kasir, with Al-Tabri, with Al-Qurtubi, with al jalain Argue with your scholar. When I tell you all these verses has been abrogated, it is not my opinion. I'm really not interested in the Quran. It is a savage book for savage people like ISIS. This has nothing to do with me. But I want to share with you, save you some time. All these verses you're going to quote. I don't care. If you quote a verse in the Quran and you don't see blood come out of it, it is abrogated. Not because you saw that doc said so, Abu Ubaidah. If you go to Ibn Kasir or Al-Tibra al Qurtabi, read about a man by the name Abu Ubaidah. He said, he said, Kulli ayah fiha tarq al-qital hiya mansukha. Every verse, are you hearing me? Yusuf, you hear me? Every verse in the Quran does not include killing, is abrogated. Even chapter 9, verse 6, as I shared with you, is abrogated, not because I said so, because your scholars said so, and believe it or not, 600 million in the world has been killed by your people, until now, somebody got killed the last hour by your people, because they believe in the Quran, and they believe in the interpretation of your Muslim scholar. Let's move on. The first portion we covered so far is ISIS kill people, because it is allowed in the Quran, it is allowed in Islam, because if you are an infidel, you must be brought to death. And the uh, second point I'd like to share with you is the vast majority of ISIS victims has been Muslim. That is a good excuse. People say, well, you see, lots of people who are killed by ISIS are Muslims. No, 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 no. ISIS never kill Muslims. ISIS only kill hypocrites like you, Mr. Yusuf. How do I know if you are a hypocrite or not? It's very simple. Let me quote you a verse from the Quran. Quran chapter 3 and verse 167. Allah Almighty said that he, Allah, might know the hypocrites. And it was said to them, come engage in war for the sake of Allah or contribute. Are you following me so far? They said, if we know how to engage in war, we would have followed you. They are closer on that day to infidelity than to faith. Every Muslim man and woman out there right now are called by Allah to be a true Muslim believer. By doing what? Two things. Engage in war or contribute to those who are fighting. That's why I see Saudi Arabia, the entire country, are true Muslims. Half give money to ISIS and the other half willing to go and kill with ISIS. Reality of Islam. So if you are not willing to engage in war and if you are not willing to literally, physically, uh, financially give money to those who engage in war, you're a hypocrite. That's not me. That's your Allah's word in the Quran. What is the punishment for the hypocrite? You don't want to come fight with us to kill some Christians, some Jews, or some Americans? The answer is in Quran chapter 9 and verse 73. And here is Allah's word. Allah said, O you prophet, perform jihad. Yes, it is a holy war. 
war. Even of the Quran did not say holy war because it is not hugging and kissing. I love it how you in your uh, presentation about jihad, you always talk about uh, your parents perform jihad against you or you perform jihad. No, you, there are 28 verses in the Quran where the word jihad is mentioned. You only mention the two which have nothing to do with jihad, but you leave and escape the other 26 verses. And its scholar interpretation is all over your books. It is jihad. All your prophet perform jihad against the infidels and the hypocrites. That's why ISIS are killing hypocrites. Now, the third reason why people think ISIS are not Islam is because ISIS is not a state. They are not a state. Why? Because some Muslim men like Barack Hussein Obama refused to call them a state. But in reality, ISIS have done so much. I do not know how much ISIS can do besides what they have done in the last four years that we cannot call them a state. For heaven's sake, they moved from Iraq and Syria to 28 countries. Should we wait until they took over the White House so, so we can call them a state? For example, as you see in the slide, that is uh, October, uh, 31st of July 2014. ISIS has already killed more than one, 170,000. In your argument, in your debate on, or teaching online, you make, you're you literally making it like there is no ISIS. We do not know even who is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. No, ISIS is real. There are massive, huge amount of bodies has been discovering as they have these huge graves with thousands of people were killed. We have the videos to show it to you if you are interested as much as you like to watch these things. Let's move on to four, the four reasons why ISIS are uh, true Muslims. Muslim, the people like you, would say ISIS is simply a terrorist organization. And since they're a terrorist organization, that means they're not really a Muslim. No, let me share with you from the Quran that your Allah is a terrorist, his angels are terrorists, Muhammad is a terrorist, and every Muslim believer is a terrorist. Three minutes Quran left. 3, 151, Allah said, we will cast terror into the heart of those who became infidels. If Allah will cast terror in the heart of those who became infidels, that make Allah what? A loving God? No, a terrorist. Quran chapter 8, verse 12, when your Lord revealed to the angels, I am with you, so make firm those who believed, I will cast terror into the heart of those who became infidels. Here is Allah and his angels terrorizing the infidels. And what the good Muslim believers will do, listen carefully, so strike above their necks and strike off every finger from them. And when ISIS behead people, when ISIS cut their fingers, we say they're not good Muslims. No, they are practicing to Islam. Quran chapter 8 verse 60, Allah said, and prepare for them whatever power you can of the tying of horses, strike terror into the enemy of Allah your enemy and others without them. You do not know them. Can you imagine with me? Allah in the Quran is ordering the Muslim believer to terrorize people they do not even know. How about Quran chapter 59 verse 13? Listen carefully, my dear friends. You, Allah speaking to the Muslim believers, you are a greater terror in their, sh in their chest than Allah. That is because they are people who do not understand. Wow, here is the reality. ISIS are terrorists, therefore they are Muslims. ISIS excuse, execute, <laughs> kill, capture prisoners. That's what people will say. If they kill their own prisoners, that means they're not good Muslims. Wow, I got a verse for you. Quran chapter 8 verse 67, where it says, It was not for a prophet to take captive until he had made a great slaughter in the land. Do you understand that? First, you go to war, then you do a great slaughter, and then you can capture some prisoners of war for yourself. ISIS kills children and slave and rape and force women into marriage. Wow, that is a good topic. You know why? Because I see in the life of Muhammad and I see in the teachings left. of the Quran, that's exactly what every Muslim should do. They should kill women and children. They actually should uh, uh, rape women and children as Muhammad and early Muslims did. Let me share with you, first of all, in Quran chapter 33, verse 21, we know that Muhammad is the noblest prophet. Uh, Anwar Awalki, one of the great Muslim uh, jihadi, I believe, he made a great statement. He said, they fought Muhammad, as a matter of fact, this is written all over your books. Muhammad and early Muslims fought during the night. And during the night, they killed women and children. They went to Muhammad and he said, they are of them. Also, Muhammad used catapults. Catapults is a machine you use in Muhammad. It's the best of their technology where you put rocks and fire in it and shoot threw it on the villages. Muhammad burned villages. Muhammad crushed people with rocks as rocks 
according to the word of the great uh, gentleman, Anwar Awalki, Iraq does not know the difference between a man or a child, women or men. This is the reality of war. Thank you. Yusuf, you can reply. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, basically, in opening discussion, I laid down certain criteria, and I'm disappointed that Usama Dagdog never dealt with any of the issues that I came in rebuttal. For example, I started off by saying that as a Christian extremist, a Christian fundamentalist, he operates on a double standard because I understand the point that we're not discussing the Bible. But if you, for example, have in the Bible institutionalized gang rape under the alleged dictates of Yahweh, that men, women and children can be killed, can be massacred if they do not believe in Yahweh, that they can be murdered and raped, then how can you have the same, how can you have the audacity to have the same critique against the Quran? As an atheist, you could, but as a Christian fundamentalist, you cannot. Again, you never dealt with it. I asked you about Numbers 31 verse 17. You obviously never replied to it. I don't think you would be able to reply to Numbers 31 verse 17. It condemns you completely. I then presented an analysis of political passages, uh, political writers who basically gave the perspective that all these individuals who join ISIS are youths, they are novices, they are scripturally illiterate, they have no knowledge of religion. When Didier Francois was kept for 10 months in the ISIS captivity, he had absolutely no um, uh, awareness or indication or where people discuss religion with him or the Quran, you had nothing to say with them. I gave a demonstration of what abrogation really meant. And you tried to present a particular response, but again, you had no particular, um, uh, uh, nothing of substance that came out. I gave you a particular reply by Muhammad Asad, and what Muhammad Asad, he says, is that at the root of the so-called doctrine of our abrogation may lie the inability of some of the early commentators to reconcile one Quranic passage with another. So, for example, you'd have a passage in the Quran which says, when you approach prayer, do not approach prayer with a mind intoxicated. And then it says, it's uh, which is better, intoxication or, 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 uh, or is there harm in detoxication. It says there's harm and there's benefit, but the harm outweighs the benefit. And then finally, that where alcohol is prohibited. And so these commentators didn't know how to reconcile these particular passages. And so they invented the whole doctrine of abrogation. But importantly, and you never dealt with this, Osama, in the Hadith literature, there is nothing which says that a particular verse is abrogated by another verse. Not one. Give me one hadith which says that Surah 9 verse 5 abrogates all the other verses of the Quran dealing with warfare. You can quote Ibn Kathir, you can quote Tabiri, but they date 700 years after the Prophet. They date at a much later time period. I challenge you to give me one verse of the Quran which says this verse is abrogated. You could not provide it. I challenge you to give me one aspect in the hadith which said Surah 9 verse 5 abrogates Surah 2 verse 190 or Surah 2 verse 256. You couldn't provide me anything. Thing. So on those particular points, you couldn't respond at all on those particular issues. And I think my particular argument still stands. I then went on to suggest that um, some of the verses which in fact focus on the issue of abrogation appear in the Meccan context. For example, Surah 16, Surah Nahal, chapter 101. Now, abrogation is supposed to be something which occurred in the context of Medina. But yet you have a verse in the Quran which alludes to to abrogation, and that is a Meccan surah. Yet those who argue for abrogation in the Quran use a Meccan surah to justify Medina surahs abrogating the Meccan surahs, which doesn't make sense. We just chose the nonsensical hogwash that you're basically presenting in your entire argumentation. I then gave practical examples in the Quran detailing verses of war. And I said that in almost every single context, maybe Surah 9 verse 29 is an exception, but in every single context, it's always in the context of defense of warfare. Now, there are certain standards and guidelines given by the Prophet Muhammad when he went out in war. And this is found in the Hadith literature. You, for example, said that he allowed the killing of men, women, and children, that he allowed the rape. I gave you an example where there was a direct prohibition against rape, and more particularly in the Hadith literature, the Prophet Muhammad stated, never kill innocent people, ISIS kills innocent people. Never torture prisoners of war, ISIS tortures prisoners of war. He said, never kill animals, ISIS engages in wholesale destruction of the land. Never destroy crops, ISIS destroys the entire environment. Never destroy infrastructure, ISIS destroys infrastructure. He says, never mutilate the bodies of the dead, alive and he goes on to say that houses of worship must be respected now these are sayings made by the prophet muhammad in the context of warfare what part of that verse did you not understand when the quran for example says fight those who fight against you what part of that verse don't you understand then you mention surah 9 verse 29 and the passage you gave is fight those who despite having vouchsafe revelation not believe allah or the last day not to consider forbidden that which god and his apostle have forbidden and quite interestingly, you did a double game here with me, Usama. You know that? You played this double game because 
Generally, you'd quote Ibn Kathir. Generally, you'd quote Ibn Jari Tabari. Generally, you'd go and quote Al-Tafsir Jalalain and all these particular commentators. Why didn't you quote any of the classical Islamic exegetes on Surah 9 verse 29? If you look at Surah 9, verse 29, Sahih Muslim, book number 37, Hadith number 6,670, it says, this verse refers to the expedition of Tabuk. Riyadh al-Salihin, book number 1, Hadith number 21, it said that verse refers to the expedition of Tabuk. Sahih Bukhari, volume 6, book number 60, Hadith number 435, it says that the verse refers to the impending attack by the Byzantines on the Muslims. If you look at Ibn Sa'd, you know Ibn Sa'd in his Kitab al-Tabakat al-Kabir, he states, that in relation to Surah 9, verse 29, news had reached the Prophet Muhammad that the Byzantines had concentrated large forces uh, and Heraclius had sent some of the military to Balkha. And this is when the Prophet Muhammad summoned his people to the expedition of Tabuk. The expedition of Tabuk was preceded by the Battle of Mu'atta, which began when an emissary of the Prophet was assassinated while delivering a letter to a Roman ally. Um, and that particular uh, emissary was assassinated. Executing emissaries was an act of war. That was an act of Roman aggression. And in that particular context, that led to the expedition of Tabuk. And the vast majority of commentators point out that Surah 9 verse 29 details the expedition of Tabuk. Now, I find it quite fascinating, Usama, that you're engaging in this duplicitous double standard because you're quoting Ibn Kathir, you're quoting Tafsir Jalalain, you're quoting Ibn Jari Tabari. But why is it when it came to Surah 9 verse 29, which is one of the few verses in the Quran which doesn't have a context, you never went to the classical exegetes? Why didn't you do that? Is that a decent question? Will you be honest enough to answer that in your reply why you never went to the classical exegetes? Then you went on to basically give the argumentation that um, I think you pointed out sort of five verse 72 and made mention of something about a mafia um, a perspective that the Quran views all Christians as infidels and they need to be basically fought against. What you fail to understand and mention also is that there's other verses in the Quran, for example, which says, Why didn't you quote that? Why didn't you quote that, Osama? That basically says, nearest to you are those who say we are Christians, because amongst them are men devoted to learning, unlike you, men who have renounced the world, and men who are not arrogant. So why do you have this duplicitous double standard in terms of how you're quoting? You mentioned um, Surah 4, verse 89, um, detailing the issue of apostasy. Again, you never dealt with my response. I said that Surah 4, verse 90 says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ يَسِلُونَ عِلَىٰ قَوْمٍ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ مِثَاقٍ Except those who join a group between you and whom there is a treaty. And basically, they withdraw against you and fight not against you, even if they reject Islam, then Allah has opened up no way against them. So what part of that verse did you not understand? You're quoting Imam Shafi, but you must understand that Imam Shafi was writing in the context of warfare. And certainly the Fiqh legislation that developed during the time of the Abbasid period was based upon the interpretive context that the Muslim community found themselves at that particular time. So when they wanted to justify an expansionist view of Islam, they would mythologize the life of the Prophet. They would invent sayings. They would attempt to basically make that this is expansionist fighting warfare. But you should know the Quran. You claim to have translated the Quran, and yet you have not provided a single refutation to any of the passages that I mentioned. Surah 47 verse 4. You remember you started off the discussion by saying that I don't know Arabic and quite clearly I don't know Arabic, but you know Arabic. And yet you said that in that verse there's no mention of harb. You remember that? You said that when it says when you meet the unbelievers, you are just simply to kill them. And I said, in what context are you to kill them? Is this just a meeting them on the street, on the beachfront, in a shabin? What context is it? And I, you said there's no verse on warfare, but I gave you the passage. It says, Hatta tada al harbu that if the war lays down in burden, so smiting them or meeting the unbelievers is certainly in the context of warfare. Now, all you need to do, Sama, is read the entire verse. Finish it. One minute left. That's the point. Don't just simply quote, uh, fight the unbelievers, slay the unbelievers. If I were to say, as I pointed out, kill Usama Dagdog, it would make me seem like a killer. But if I were to say, kill Usama Dagdog, if he attempts to rape your mother and your children, then can you see what the context is? So when the Quran says fight the unbelievers, that's atomizing the text. But it, when it says fight those who fight against you, that provides a context. Now, what part of that don't you understand? Are you doing this deliberately out of mischief, out of ignorance? You pointed out, and I just showed you quite clearly, the word harb appears in Surah 47 verse 4. Why do you not mention that? Um, we can go on the rape. The rape. We mentioned the story of rape, rape of Muslim women. 
I mentioned the fact that rape is institutionalized in the Old Testament. You find Deuteronomy 22 mentions the rape of a captive woman, that she has to be married to the rapist. The Quran condemns rape. So I think it's important to summer when you analyze scripture, don't be a hypocrite. You accuse me of being a hypocrite. Don't engage in hypocritical double standard and go to the original source and don't twist and Time atomize scripture to pick cherries. You, Usama, you have two minutes to reply. First of all, I do not follow the teaching of the Old Testament, my friend. I follow the teaching of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us in the New Testament to love our enemy, to love you, our Muslim enemies. Uh, the Old Testament killing is justifiable because it's killing of wicked. The Quran killing is unjustifiable because it's killing of godly Christian people just for being a Christian. Uh, you need an example. Uh, thank you so much. You actually give me an example about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what you call the uh, abrogation of the Quran. You said in one verse that Christians are wonderful people. In the other verse, they are infidel. <laughs> That's your own answer, sir. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you listen to me when I talk or not. There is no innocent Christian. They're all infidels. Killing captive of war is reality. Quran teaches that. Quran chapter 865. It is not for a prophet to have risen of war until he have made a great slaughter. Not until the war is set aside in your verse. No, it is actually you have made, until you have made a great slaughter in the earth. That is the teaching of the Quran. Don't argue with me about abrogation. You need to argue with your own scholar. Let's continue about Muhammad as a child molester. Aisha told us that I was in Aisha said, Muhammad married me when I was six years old and he had sex with me when I was nine years old. Can you tell me that does not make your Muhammad a child molester, sir? Uh, let's move on. I can talk about Zayd ibn Sabit and how Muhammad took his wife. But Muslims in general are allowed to literally uh, rape little children according to Quran chapter 65, verse 4. Listen. As for those of you women who despair of menstruation, if you doubt that they may be pregnant, as uh, their prescribed waiting time is three months, as well as for those who have not yet begun menstruation. Little children in Islam, you can marry a child after birth. That is what they taught me in Sharia when I studied Sharia in college in Egypt. You can marry a child after birth and you can have sex with her anytime. The nine years old to be following Muhammad example, but in reality, before their period. Here, little children. You have two minutes, please. Your time starts now. Reading correctly, Surah 65, verse 4. What Surah 65, verse 4 says, and this is a translation by Muhammad Asad. I've got no time to deal with the Arabic text. It says, now, as for such of you women, as are beyond the age of monthly causes, as well as for such as do not have causes, their waiting period, if you have any doubt, shall be three calendar months. And as for those who are the child, the end of the waiting term shall come when they deliver their burden. So clearly, you've heard of the context of menopause. Because Surah 4, if you look at Surah Nisa, Chapter 4, verse 3. What it basically says, it gives you the actual period of marriage. It says here, Make trials of orphans until they reach the age of marriage. So the Quran contemplates the age of marriage, and the age of marriage is viewed as the age of maturity. You raise a point of Aisha, and again, that's another debate on its own. But one thing which I basically point out to you, and you need to look at the historical facts. Certainly there are passages in Bukhari which indicate she was extremely young. These passages are not consistent. Historically speaking, Asma, who was the uh, sister of Aisha, was 10 years older than Aisha. She died in the year 73 of, uh, after Hijrah. She died at the age of 100. At the uh, one year after Hijrah, she would have been 28 years old. And the historical context points out that according to Ibn Kathir, and you, again you point out Ibn Kathir, in Al-Bidaya wa Al-Nihaya, it mentions that Asma died um, in the year 73 of the Hijra at the age of 100, and she was 10 years older than Aisha. Now, if she was 28 years old at the time of the first year of Hijri, which would mean that Aisha would have been 17, 18 at the time of the marriage or the nikah or the consummation of the prophet. That's something which you need to go and calculate from a historical perspective. But coming back to the perspective of what you raised, Numbers 31 verse 17, it speaks as the following. Kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that has had sex with a man. Now, Usama, how does a soldier in the field determine whether a woman has had sex or not? Consider your mother or your children or your own family. No matter how sick or lay they may, how would you feel if a man like Moses, living back then, claiming to speak for God, asked, sent men in jails, hacked the men and women and to death, and took for themselves... Usama, your you have two minutes to respond. Osama, your time All starts. right, sounds good. Well, <laughs> I love how you... Uh, Try to defend your Muhammad by lying. You are following a child molester, my friend. Aisha said that. I'm not saying I said that. That is what is written by your own Muslim scholars. 
That is in Sahih Muslim. Aisha said, I was six when he married me. He had sex with me when I was nine. I do not, don't argue with me. Go talk to Sahih Muslim, okay? Meet Sahih Muslim and talk to him. Now let's move on. Muslim rape. Yeah, ISIS are raping women. Why? Because they follow the teaching of the Quran. Quran chapter 4, verse 24. And married women are also forbidden, except, I love the exception in the Quran, except that all that your right hand possessed. This is the decree of Allah for you, and it is law for you besides that to seek out women with your money, chased without fornication. So whatever you enjoy, buy it, that is their private part, from them. These are the female, the female, so give them their wages. Guess what? Your Muhammad and his followers had sex with women, with money. They were prostituting themselves with women, especially during the war. How about open a house of prostitution? Quran chapter 24, verse 3. Because Muslims would say, ISIS are not Muslims. They are having a house of prostitution. That actually, that is a practice of the word of Allah in the Quran. Quran chapter 24, verse 3. And it says, do not compel your young females. These are the females the Muslims captured in war. To become prostitute if they seek, if they want to keep chaste, so that you seek the material of this world's life. And whoever can build them, so surely after they were compelled, Allah is forgiven, merciful. Don't force these young girls to be a prostitute. But if you did it, that's okay. Allah is forgiven, merciful. Let's learn about Muhammad the rapist. In the final statement, he will read, Muhammad forced a 17 years old Jewish girl by the name Safiya bin Tuhayyai to marry him after killing her father, husband, and brother in the battle of Khaybar. This is after he had first given her to Dihya as a slave. Can you imagine? Sahih Muslim is telling us, your Muhammad was raping a woman on the night he killed her husband and father and brother. You see if you have two minutes to respond. Okay. Thank you. Just quickly, I think again we have a double standard here. Because if you look at Leviticus 25, verse 44 to 46, and particularly Leviticus, Exodus chapter 21, verse 7, 1 to 11, it says, when a man sells his daughter as a slave... She will not be freed at the end of the six years if she does not pleasure the man. What does pleasure mean, Usama? Then the man who bought her may sell her. In Leviticus 25, verse 44 to 46, you may purchase male or female slaves among the foreigners who live amongst you. You may purchase the children of such residents, foreigners. You may treat them as property, passing them on to your children as inheritance. You may treat them as slaves and you can engage in sex with them. Sex slavery is institutionalized in the context of the Old Testament. However, if we look at the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 25, 25, 23, starting from verse 22, it speaks about the prohibited degrees or the categories in terms of individuals that you cannot marry. So, for example, you cannot marry your mothers, you cannot marry your daughters, you cannot marry your sisters, you cannot marry your father's sisters. In verse 24, it says, Wal muhsanati min an nisa illa ma malakata imanukum. Also prohibited a woman already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Now, what is a prohibition here, Usama? Is a prohibition for sex, that you cannot have sex with them? Or is it for marriage? Because it cannot be for sex, because in that case, it basically would impl imply the contrary position that you cannot, in fact, commit adultery. So the prohibition in verse 24 is from marriage. You cannot marry a woman who's already married because polyandry is forbidden. But you can marry a woman who amongst the captors. Can you have sex with them? Well, look what does verse 25 say. Verse 25 says that if any of you have not had the means to wait free believing a woman, then they may marry believing girls among those whom their right hands possessed. And then it goes on to say that they should be not chastful, nor lustful, nor should you take them as paramours, nor should you take them as concubines. You cannot take them as concubines. The story of Safiya is basically fabricated. If you look at the background and the context, and I don't have the time to deal with it, Safiya was abused by her husband, and she had a dream that the moon fell on her lap. You know that we, we have to go to a break. We have to stop there. You'll have a chance to respond when we get back after this, Yusuf. Is ISIS a true representation of Islam? More on that when we come back after this. And we are back here on ABN and the Trinity Channel. We are discussing whether or not ISIS is a true representation of Islam. If you're just tuning in, we have with us two guests. We have Yusuf Ismail and Usama Dakduk. And they're discussing this. And we want to go back now to Usama, who has a two-minute response here, followed by Yusuf's two-minute response. Usama, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you. Uh, we are not following the book of Deuteronomy to marry, but we're following the teaching of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. In the book of Matthew, chapter 19, he said, A man leave his father and mother as it is written from the beginning, and he unite with his wife, and they become one flesh. Not as Muhammad wrote on the Quran uh, 600 years later, 2 and 3 and 4. And what your right hand possessed.
We can talk about slavery in another topic because that's not today the topic for today. Anyway, uh, seven reasons seven reason why some people like Mr. Yusuf or others will tell us that ISIS are not Muslim because ISIS threatens the, religion, the, the religious min minority uh, with genocide. I mean, they're killing people right and left. Where are these things they learn how to genocide? To learn from the Quran, from Muhammad himself, the great prophet of Islam. Uh, Quran chapter 33, verse 26 and 27. You're familiar with it, Yusuf. It says, and he, that's Allah, brought down the people of the book. That's actually Bani Quraiza. It should say the Jews, not the people of the book. The people of the book is, you know, Jews and Christian. But anyway, who backs them from the strong places and cast the terror. Your Allah, the terrorist, cast the terror into their hearts. A group of them you're killing. What group? All the men who have moustache and older. And a group of them you're taking as captives. What is group? Women and children. And a group of them you are taking captive. And he said in verse 27, And he made you to inherit their land, their homes, and their money, and a land which you had never set foot on. I believe that is the rest of the world today. And Allah was mighty over all things. Three points I'd like to share about this. I love it how you represent that. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, the gentleman uh, who uh, set these people aside, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az, is his name. He was one of them. No, he hated them and he wanted them dead for a long time. Uh, you said that uh, 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 what, what's it? Allah told Muhammad through Angel Jibreel, why are you washing your sword from the blood? Go and kill. We have to go to Yusuf. Go ahead. Okay, just quickly, Usama, on that particular point, if you look at the figure, the Quran says some ye slew in Surah 33 and some ye took captive. Now, if you look at the narrative given Ibn, Ibn Ishaq, the figures are not basically accurate. Some say 400, some say 500, some say up to 600. But here's the problem. If you read Ibn Ishaq, and I urge you to read it, I don't know if you've read it, it tells us that the Banu Quraiza surrendered to be judged, and they were sent to the house of Bint al Harid, who was a woman belonging to the Banu al Najjar tribe. You familiar with that? Now, if the number of 600 to 900 is in fact true, then each of the warrior men would on average have had two kids plus a wife times the 900 by three, who would have 2,000 people, up to 2,000 people. Now, you need to answer this. How is it possible at that stage, when there was no prison in Medina, that 2,000 people could be confined in one particular house? And so many people have questioned the legitimacy and the credibility of the numbers based on the illogic of the fact that this particular number was in fact assassinated and murdered or executed. The Quran says some ye slew and some ye took. It doesn't mention anything about killing of 800. The other point which is important is that Saad ibn Mu'ad was from the Aus tribe and the Jews in fact appointed him to pass a judgment on them. And they further went to say that we want Saad ibn Mu'ad to judge us in accordance with Jewish law because there was no historical precedent. And what did Saad ibn Mu'ad do? He looked at the Torah. And what did he look at? He looked at Deuteronomy chapter 23, uh, chapter 20. And basically, what did he say? He went on to basically say the following. And this, and I, it's important that you read and you understand this, Osama. He went on to say that when thou come nice unto a city to fight against it, proclaim peace. But if the city does not answer you, then smite and murder every male with the edge of the sword, but the woman and the little ones and the cattle, even the spoil thereof, you shall take unto yourself, thou shalt eat the spoil of thy enemies. So Saad ibn Muad judged the Jews in accordance with Jewish law, but not as strictly as the case warranted. Because in Jewish law, there were two types. One were the cities of fire. We have to give you, uh, Osama, go ahead, two minute response. Let me read to you what Saad ibn Muad said. He said, Allahumma in kuntu abqayta fi min harb min qurayshayan fabqini laha. He was praying to Allah that he keep him alive so he can revenge from the people of Quraysh. He was wounded by the Jew. Muhammad fixed his wound and he loved Muhammad and he hated the Jews. They thought he would be a just judge, but he obviously judged that wicked judge, which Muhammad, by the way, said, you have judged by the judgment of Allah from the seven heavens. Muhammad was washing his sword from the blood and Allah said to him by Isn Jibreel, why you wash your soul by the blood? The angels did not stop fighting. Here is Allah and his angels want to fight the people the Jewish people. So he strikes their necks and they were between 700 to 800. That's not my numbers. I was not there. I have no idea. That's what I read from your own Muslim scholars. All of them in an agreement that says how many people were killed. Why you argue with me? Go to your scholar, correct your books, fix them. Do whatever you want to do, my friend. I am here just to tell you the truth about what is written in your books, which you are, I think, purposely ignoring. 
You tell me in your videos, are, the, the whole people were 600. No, if they are that large, if they are that small number, why Muhammad sieged them for 25 nights? 25 nights, he sieged the village. They run out of water, they run out of food, they're about to die of starvation. And that's when they said, we will leave. We'll let you have the city. You know what he said? No, he wants them dead. It doesn't matter what Sa'd ibn Ma'as said or it does not say. That's not what you read in the Bible. I'm not going to go to the Bible because that's not the topic for tonight. If you want to have peace, that's what you read yourself, then let them live and they will survive. But if they choose to fight you, you fight them. Read the Bible, my friend. Here, these people say, we want to have peace. And Muhammad said, no. We will give you the city. Muhammad said, no. We'll give you the city and the animals and the sword. And Muhammad said, no. What do you want, Muhammad? I want you dead. As a matter of fact, that's what Muhammad wished for all the Jews. He said that their judgment will not come. And Yusuf, you have two minutes to respond. Let's look at Sahih Bukhari, volume 5, book number 59, hadith number 362. It says, narrated Ibn Umar, Bani and Nadir and Bani Quraitha fought against the Prophet. So the Prophet exiled Banu Nadir and allowed the Banu Quraiza to remain at the places in Medina, taking nothing from them till they fought again. That's in Sayyid Bukhari, not Ibn Ishaq, Sayyid Bukhari fought again the Prophet and then he then executed their men. But yet coming back to the issue, if the story of 600 is correct, according to Ibn Ishaq, then the question still remains is that how is it that all of them were confined in one house, in the house of Bint al-Harit, a woman belonging to the Bani and Najar tribe in Medina. How is that possible? Then you mentioned something about the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi washed his sword before he went to the Banu Quraiza. You mentioned that. But I want to ask you, why would he wash his sword with blood? Because at the Battle of Khandak, there was no fighting that took place. So how could he wash his sword, which you claim was blood infested, when no battle took place at the Battle of Khandak? They, they, they dig the trench around Medina. And at the time when they went to the Banu Quraysa, there was no battle. So what battle are you talking about? I think it's important you need to go back that Saad universally judged them according to the law of the Torah. And the law of the Torah says, when the Lord thy God delivers it into your hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the woman and the little ones and the cattle, all that is in the city, you shall take for yourselves. Now note, the verse before this in Deuteronomy says that a city that is within your control, which the Banu Quraiza were, you are to kill them all. You are to massacre them all. So Saad ibn Muad judged them lesser than the standard according to Jewish law and he applied the lesser standard to them but again i think osama needs to be shown for the game you played in a discussion you had with jim schneider you said that when a woman is raped she has to bring four witnesses or she will be slashed 80 times yet in surah nur verse 4 it says that those who make the allegation against a woman they are to bring four eyewitnesses now my question is if you can misrepresent and falsify something like that what will you not do for falsifying? Usama, you have 10 minutes to respond. Go ahead. I don't want to get into this, but I have to get to it. The four eyewitnesses is not just four people seeing a man and a woman naked in bed, but they must see the inside the my friend, because there is another sin. It's a smaller sin. It's called lemon. Your Muhammad and Allah in the Quran consider the lemon to be a small sin. So that is sick. A man can play with a woman in bed naked, and both of them have their orgasm, and that's not sin in the Quran. In the Bible, if a man look at a woman and lust by his eyes, and lust, look by his eyes, and lust by his, by his heart, he can commit adultery. Your Muhammad is an adulterer. Go to Quran chapter 66, verse 1. When he slept with Mary, the Coptic woman, in his own wife, half his bed, in her night, under her roof. That is sick. I'm not going to get into this. Let's move on to our study. Why is the violence? Why is the violence? I love it how the West are protecting the Muslim, and the West doing everything they can to make the, to make the Muslim look good. The liberals in the West are stupid. So they say self-radicalization. Why is that? Because these people who commit that crime, who do, they have nothing to do with Islam. They are agree, they're in agreement with you. I think you, you literally did a good job to brainwash the West, Yusuf. So the first reason they said these, rape, these people are uneducated. And you yourself said tonight that these people are uneducated. ISIS is uneducated. Are you trying to tell me that Osama bin Laden is uneducated? Ayman al-Zawahiri is uneducated? Abdurrahman, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi are, are uneducated. He has more education than you can ever learn about Islam. I can sit under the feet of Abu, of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and learn from Islam. And they, you tell me he's uneducated. Are you kidding me? Do you know that there are plenty of people all over the world today who cannot read a word? But they do not commit the violence of Islam. And the second thing is the West will send millions of dollars to open school, to open university for the Muslim world to educate them. Hopefully that that, that will end the terrorization of Islam to the world. Sadly, 
I learned the truth in Egypt. I did not learn anything about to be a terrorist as a Muslim until I went to college. That's where the brotherhood bring the, the new generation to believe in the true understanding of Islam, which the West call radical. So the second reason, that these people are poor. Excuse me? ISIS are poor. They have more money than the, than the United States of America. We are 20 trillion in the hole. ISIS have billions of cash. All the money they need is going to be provided by the rich Saudi and other countries. As a matter of fact, they've been selling oil in the black market for years. And Barack Hussein Obama, as a Muslim, did not stop them from selling this oil to Turkey. And he just let it go, even though he can take these tanks from taxes and stop the selling of oil in the black market. And once again, there are plenty of people in the world who are very poor, do not have even money to eat a bite in the next few hours. They're going to go to bed hungry. And these people do not commit the violence which we see in Islam. But Muslims, true Muslim believers, this jihadis, this whole are the terrorists, the, the one who follows the teaching of the Quran, the rich, they have all the money they need. The third reason, that these people are mentally ill. Really? They're crazy? Every Muslim who believes in the Quran, every Muslim who believes the interpretation of the Quran by a Muslim scholar are mentally ill. And that's exactly what the United States of America are doing to these people whom we catch in war, shooting and killing our own American soldiers. They bring them to America, they provide them with everything they need, a copy of the Quran, a prayer rug, halal food, Ramadan meals and during the night, and all these wonderful things. And then they provide them with the best lawyers to set them free. That's show you how stupid the West are. They learn it from you, Yusuf, that they are good Muslims, but there is not good Islam. There are good people who claim to be Muslim who know nothing about Islam. But the moment you know Islam, you are nothing but an evil person. That's exactly what is true as teaching the Quran. If you terrorize people, you do not even know. If you behead people just because Allah said so, Allah, Satan, the God of Muhammad, that make you an evil person. Now, Military, military, they're not military crazy. They're not mentally ill. Why? Because these people can fly an airplane. These people can do heart surgery and brain surgery. They're very educated from all aspects of life. They're teachers, they're doctors, they're lawyers, name it. They're not mentally ill. I believe the West is mentally ill, and the West is, is going to pay someday for their stupidity and what they're doing. The fourth reason, they tell us, that these people misunderstand and distort Islam. That's exactly what you're trying to tell me today, Mr. Yusuf, you think I misunderstood Islam. You think I, uh, I distort Islam. I'm taking these verses out of context. When Allah in the Quran clearly teaches, this is the final word, Quran chapter 9. I don't care what is written in the Quran before 9.5. Even 9.6 has been abrogated by 9.5. Not because you some Dahtok said so. No, I'm not a scholar, but your scholar said so. Six million 600 million people has been killed by the hand of Muslim because they misunderstand the Quran. It's amazing. I can quote you many verses on the Quran which teach hate. But you could not bring me one verse. Truly teach love. Not the Christian are wonderful people. No, love the Christian people. Not these people are not, no, no. Love them. Like, like Jesus taught us, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. If your enemy hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is, is thirsty, give him something to drink. Bless them when they curse you. Pray for them. Can you show me one verse like that in the Quran? Does not exist. Not one verse. How it is amazing that I am an ignorant of the Quran, and I'm not a scholar of Islam, and all the scholars are stupid because you are the smartest man, and we can bring from the Quran all the proof and all the evidence that the Quran is an evil book, and ISIS are true followers of Islam, with over 150 verses. If I have this debate go for another 10 hours, I can keep going and going and going, reading the Quran and the interpretation of the Quran by Muslim scholars. But you yourself, Mr. Yusuf, could not bring one verse. Just one verse. I don't want a verse say, the nice, or fight for defense, or fight for uh, because you're persecuted or you're kicked out of your homes. I need a verse where Allah said, love the Christian, love the Jews, love somebody. No. Quran 551 says, oh, you have believed. Do not take the Jews and the Christians as friends. They are friends to one another. Yes, the Jews like the Christian, and the Christian likes the Jews. As a matter of fact, Christian love everybody. But then he said, and whoever among you takes them for a friend, become one of them. You become an infidel. You become a wicked man. Listen to what Muhammad said in Sahih. Uh, according to all Muslim scholars, Sahih, Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, Ibn Kathir, all of them said. Listen to what Muhammad said. Do not, and I say again, do not initiate the salam, the peace, to the Jews and the Christian. And if you meet any of them in a road, force them into its narrowest alley. This is exactly 
what Muhammad taught the Muslim to do. That's why Muhammad literally said that he, 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 he descended by Allah with the sword in his hand. The last slide we have in this presentation, he said, Muhammad taught, I descended by Allah with the sword in my hand. Three minutes. And any, and my wealth will come from the shadow of my sword. Even when Muhammad was wounded in the last battle, he, wore, he went in war 29 battles when he was wounded. The, the Muslim believers, those who love us, oh, Apostle of Allah, we cannot lose you. You stay home, sir. We will fight for you. Just send us and we will kill. In eight years, Muhammad was involved in 29 wars. And then he added to it 39 with other people whom he appointed as a prince or as a leader. And he got his cut, 20%. 20% of the spoil. That's why Muhammad said, and my wealth will come from the shadow of my sword, not from my hard work, no, from the shadow of my sword. And listen, and he and the one who will disagree with me will be humiliated and disgraced. This is the true picture of Islam. From the noblest example of Islam, Muhammad, you can talk about as many as you want about the things of Muhammad he did in Mecca. How nice he was. I love it how Muslim tells the story of Muhammad's neighbor, a Jewish man who used to poop and put the poop in front of Muhammad's house every day. And Muhammad go out and clean the poop. Until one day Muhammad went out to clean the poop and there was no poop. So Muhammad got surprised, he worried. He knocked at the door, found out the Jewish neighbor is sick. He took care of him. And the Jewish man who hated Muhammad became a good Muslim. This is what I call hogwash Islam. You can say it to the West, but the reality of Islam is in the final words of Muhammad, in the final words of Allah, it is in that practice which we see in Muhammad life and the Muslim in the last 1430 years, which we see today by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Fath and Hamas and Hezbollah and Al-Shabaab. I mean, we're talking about Millions, over 40% of the Muslim people in the world today believe in the verses of the Quran and its interpretation by Muslim scholars, except you. And I believe, as I said earlier, if you continue to do what you're doing, you will be able to deceive the West. And you're doing a great job, I promise you. America will build you a mosque in every city if you just come and tell them how much loving One and minute. peaceful Islam is because they're stupid and they're digging their grave by their own hand. And the day is coming and America will regret to have one Muslim man or woman in America because when Muslim in America will have the upper hand, they will not cry for peace. They will not call for peace. This is not my words. That's the word of Allah, Quran chapter 47, 35. They're practicing the taqiyya very well right now. They're friendly and loving and peaceful, but not for long. If we cannot learn from what's happening in Europe, we will never learn anything in America. And Europe are paying a great cost, as we seen last week of the attack, another terrorist attack, which you just deny it have nothing to do with ISIS. ISIS is Islam. And even if we kill the last member of ISIS, as long as there is Islam, we have a problem in the world. As long as there are verses of the Quran and the interpretation of these verses by Muslim scholars, we have a problem, and the problem is the terrorization of the world. ISIS is the true 100% picture of Islam. They're crossing every T and dotting every I, even killing some other Muslims who are not in agreement with the teaching of the Quran. And Yusuf, you have 10 minutes to rebuttal. Go ahead. Clearly, Osama Dagdog hasn't dealt with any of the issues that are raised. He's raised a whole series of red herrings, and he never dealt with the particular issues that are basically raised. In my opening presentation, remember, I called him out on two passages. Surah 47, verse 4, he never replied to it. I also pointed out to him that in an interview he had with Jim Schneider, and I was expecting him to deal with it in his rebuttal, and if he doesn't deal with it, I want him to apologize on national television. He said that if a Muslim woman is raped, if she does not bring four eyewitnesses, then she must be lashed 80 times. Yet in Surah Nur, verse 4, it says that those who make allegation uh, uh, of a nature of adultery against women, they need to bring four eyewitnesses. And if they cannot bring four eyewitnesses, they are to be lashed 80 times. Yet Osama changed it in a discussion interview with Jim Schneider. I'm asking him, would he be willing to apologize on public television for making a false and vicious allegation? Would he be able to apologize on public television for stating that I misread Surah 47 when the word harb did not in fact exist there? When in fact I read the Quranic verse and I showed you that that occurs in the context of warfare, the word is harb. Will you apologize for those two particular points that you misled the public on? Now coming to the issue of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, that he's a noted Islamic scholar. Well, where do you get the source from? There is an internet website that says he has a PhD at one of the universities in Baghdad, but no one has verified that. In fact, the universities in Baghdad have never heard of an individual like this. 
What do you also make about the fact that a lot of the members of ISIS happened to be Baathists, who were secular nationalists, who were strong during the time of Saddam Hussein. They had absolutely no allegiance towards Islam. And now they find themselves in the context of engaging in savagery against Yazidis and other Muslims in the name of ISIS. You mentioned the fact that there's nothing about love. Nothing about love in the Quran. Did you mention that? Something about that. Something along that particular line. Well, I'll read you one particular passage. And you should have taken note of this. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 177. It says here, righteousness is not just simply to believe in Allah and to turn your faces towards the east and the west and to believe in the angels. But to spend out of your substance, out of love for him, out of love for who? For Allah. And love for who? For your kin. And for the orphans. And for the needy. And for the wayfarer. And for those who seek. And for those who are ransomed. So what do you basically say about that, Osama, when you say that there's absolutely no love? I gave you another passage in Surah Mumtahana, chapter 60, verse 8 to 9. Allah does not forbid you with regard to those who do not fight you on account of your religion, nor drive you out. To treat them with kindness. What part do you not understand? Allah loves those who are just. In a hadith, the Prophet Muhammad stated, If anyone wrongs or does injustice to a dhimmi, I am an advocate against him till the day of judgment. Did he abrogate that? That was mentioned in Medina. Why didn't you mention that? Further, what do you basically say about the fact that in Medina, for example, you had a situation where you mentioned the fact that you cannot give peace to non-Muslims. Some Jews at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to be disrespectful in Medina. So when they used to greet him, they used to say, Assamu alaikum, not Assalamu alaikum, Assamu alaikum, meaning death be upon you. This is your tongue. It's your mother tongue, Arabic. So what Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, hearing this, got angry and responded by saying to them, death and the curse of Allah, the lanat of Allah be on you. So what did the Prophet do? He demanded her to be calm and then told her that God loves the one who is kind and lenient in all matters. And that's in Sahih Bukhari, volume 8, book number 53, hadith number 83. Allah loves that you be kind and lenient in all matters. So again, don't misquote the Jews were saying, Assalamu alaikum. Aisha took objection and the Prophet said, Allah loves one who is kind and lenient in all matters. Now, what part of that hadith did you not understand? Another remarkable example is Abdullah ibn Umar. He had a sheep slaughtered for his family and he came and he said, have you given some to our neighbor, the Jew? And have you given some to the neighbor, the Jew? I heard the messenger of Allah saying, Jibril continued to advise me about treating the neighbors kindly and politely that I thought he would order me a lot to make them heirs. Jamiat Tirmidhi, Volume 4, book, book number 1, Hadith number 1943. And one can go on and on and on. What is quite fascinating, Usama, is that in all your discussions, you're bringing in new stories, new aspects. You went into Aisha, then you went into the aspect of Safiya, then you went into um, the issue of slavery. What is quite interesting is that you're not interacting with me. You've never interacted with me. When war became inevitable, the Prophet Wasallam did say, never kill innocent people. Did he say that or did he not? He did say, never torture prisoners of war. Did he say that or did he not say that? He did say, never destroy crops. He said, you cannot even burn people. You cannot even burn people. There is a hadith. You know that, Usama? That there is a hadith which, in fact, prohibits you from burning people. Are you aware of that? Yet ISIS engages in burning of individuals. Now, what is quite fascinating is that in Iraq today, women who are treated as witches or committing witchcraft, they are burnt alive. Are you aware of that? Does the Quran have anything to mention in relation to that? However, the Bible in Exodus 22, verse 18 to 20 says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whoever lies with a beast shall surely be put to death. And he that sacrifice unto any god, save unto the Lord, shall be utterly destroyed. And then the book of Judges describes the story of Jephthah, where he makes an oath and a pledge to Yahweh. And because he cannot violate the pledge, he says that if his daughter comes back in the front entrance, he will make a pledge that... Uh, uh, he will burn her, sacrifice her to God. And then because he has to fulfill his pledge to Yahweh, he has to sacrifice her to Yahweh. He has to burn her to death. So burning is existent in the Old Testament. And again, Jesus says, yes. think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. 
For verily I say unto you that heaven and earth shall pass, but one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Leviticus 21 verse 9, the daughter of a priest, if she profanes herself by playing the whore, she shall be burnt with fire in the Bible. A priest's daughter, if she is found to have lost her virginity without marriage, can receive the death penalty and she can be burnt alive. ISIS burns people alive. So if you want to split hairs and have this gutter game that you want to play, we need to ask, are they following the Bible? Or are they following the Quran? Is there anywhere in the Quran which commands people to be burnt as a punishment? Is there anywhere in the Hadith? In fact, there's a Hadith which Ali apparently burnt people. And there is a Hadith censuring him which stated that the Prophet, peace be upon him, never burn people. And here you find burning in the context of the Old Testament. The Quran in Surah 48 verse 1 says, Three in minutes. Surah Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. You're aware of that? Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. It says we have granted you a manifest victory. Now, Sama Dagdok, what was a manifest victory? Was it the Battle of Badr? Was it Uhud? Was it Khandak? Was it Hunayn? Was it Khaybar? What was a, what was a manifest victory? It was a Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And what was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a peace treaty. And who was prejudiced? The Muslims were prejudiced in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So I think it's important that you don't atomize scripture, you don't quote out of context, and you don't distort historical fact. I've given you past examples where you've openly, the, the issue about the four eyewitnesses for the rape, you've lied, openly lied. The issue about Surah 47, you openly lied. The issue about burning, burning is contained in your Bible. The issue of sex slavery, I gave you a practical example that sex slavery, it says in Leviticus, in Exodus 21, verse 7 to 11, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, she will not be freed at the end of six years if she does not pleasure the man. How does a slave pleasure the man? She must be bought and sold, and he must allow her to be bought back. Now, this is Yahweh, which would mean Jesus himself, because Jesus is Yahweh, according to your Sikh ideology and your belief system. And here he's commanding slavery and sex slavery institutionalized under God. So I think it's important. And again, Jesus himself, he alleges, he approves the beating of slaves. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, slaves be in fear of your master. So slavery is being practiced by ISIS. Slavery is institutionalized in the context of the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't disapprove of it. It uh, uh, constitutes it. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law. Yet in the Quran, you've got a classic verse, was Sa'ilina of your Rekab. What does that mean? And not only that, in Surah Nur, verse 32, it says that if you do not have the means to marry free believing women, then marry either the slave amongst your male or the female. So it didn't eliminate it entirely, but it gave a means of basically eradicating slavery. Once the slaves are married, they become part and parcel of the household, They're elevated. And you can look at a classic example in Islamic history, like the Mamluks. You heard of the Mamluks? They were slaves. In your country, Egypt, what happened to them? The Mamluks became the rulers and overlords of Egyptian society. Slaves becoming the leaders of Egyptian society. So don't teach me about history. I perhaps need to teach you about history. It's important that you basically need to go back to the source, and you haven't done that. When the Quran says, Ya ladina amanu, utkhulu fi silmi kafa, it's unconditional. It's not abrogated. It says, O you who believe, enter into peace absolutely. Enter into peace completely. A fundamental principle of Quranic exegesis tafsir is that the verses have to be understood in the context in which they were revealed. Now, in the final analysis, we need to ask, what has Osama done to show anything that ISIS implements the Islamic teaching? I gave you a practical example of individuals who didn't know anything about Islam. You haven't given us a single we reference. Have to, we, have, we have to cut to a break. But before we do, I want to encourage the audience at home. You've been listening to the debate. We've been talking about, is ISIS a true representation of Islam? And if you have a question, we want to welcome you to call in. There's a number at the bottom of the screen. You know, there's so much going on today, there's so much terrorism that ISIS is taking credit for. And the question we want to know, is ISIS a true representation of Islam? If you have a question, we encourage you to call in in just a few moments. We're going to take a break, and when we get back, we'll be back to answer that question. More after this. Please call the numbers at your screen, as we are in need of your prayers, your help, and your support. On ABN and the Trinity Channel, if you're just tuning in with us tonight, we're talking about is Islam a true representation? Is ISIS a true representation of Islam? Usama, can you continue with your discussion? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, there's so much we would we would love to really to cover in this study, but sadly, when you do a debate, you are limited on the time of what you say, what not to say. 
Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to share with our audience something very important happened in Muhammad's life. The noblest example was uh, his beautiful uh, daughter-in-law, uh, 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 Zainab bint Jahsh. We read about that in Quran chapter 33 and verse 37. And Allah in the Quran is telling that. So when Zaid has had satisfied his desire from her, we married her to you so that it would be, uh, uh, it would not be shame on the Prophet on the believers to marry the wife of their sons, and now some of them say adopted sons. You know, it's amazing. When we talk about marriage in the Bible and marriage in the Old Testament, he mentioned, and he's not here, I don't know how can, I hope he was watching me, so he maybe have something to share after that. But uh, Mr. Yusuf tells us that marriage in the Bible is actually s slavery. A man sent his wife. No, it is not. When you read the text, and I wish we can do this when uh, maybe me and him, another debate in the future. You see, this is a man giving his daughter in marriage, not a slave. This is, a, we're talking about dowry. He uh, given her for a dowry. And that is a custom in the early days, in Moses' days. That's 1,500 years. And the Bible said she will not leave her house as slaves. Can you read the message? If you read the message, she's not going to leave her father's house as slaves. That means she's not a slave. And the, the, the gentleman who's going to marry her cannot sell her to another man. If he will not marry her for some reason, or he will not marry her to his son, she come back to her father. So obviously Yusuf is jumping on the Bible, and I don't want to talk about this because this is not the topic for tonight. He's trying to get me to USA, what the United States of America are doing in the Middle East. He's trying to talk about Deuteronomy. He's trying to talk about Leviticus. He's trying to talk about the, uh, all the teaching of the Bible. And we're not talking about the Bible. We're not talking about Christianity. We're not talking about Judaism. We're talking about ISIS. Is ISIS a true representation of Islam? Here is Muhammad, the true representation of Islam. I'm not talking about somebody about Muhammad himself. That's the topic for tonight. Did Muhammad live the laws as it is given in the Bible? Was Muhammad have the right to have sex with his daughter-in-law, even if, she, if his son was adopted? And we know the story in the Quran is, is, a very, is a very shameful as it is given by Muslim scholars. And they tell us, Muhammad went to visit his son by adoption. And his daughter-in-law came out and she was at night wearing some soft clothes, going to bed, and the winds... Amazing how Allah is just uh, working with his wind with Muhammad perfectly. Lift up her clothes and he saw from her what caused him to lust after her. Muhammad was a lustful man. And then Muhammad says, Subhana muqallab al How great Allah who changed my heart towards thee. She told this to her husband who knows Muhammad very well. He is his son for heaven's sake. And he knows if he will not divorce his, his wife for Muhammad to marry her, literally... He will marry her as a widow. He will kill him to marry her. So he went to his daddy. I want to divorce my wife. Oh, keep thy wife. No, I want to marry my wife. No, keep thy wife. And Allah rebuked Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad. We know. You know. I know. You like her. You lost after her. Maybe Muslims will say love. But it's not love. It's lust. And then you read the story in the Quran. There was no shame on the Prophet where Allah has ordained for him. No shame on Muhammad, shame on you Muslim to read these verses in the Quran. And you think that is the final word of Allah and Muhammad is the noblest example. That's a sick. That is a shameful thing for your prophet, the noblest example, to be living in sin, in adultery with his daughter-in-law all the years of his life until he died. No shame, shame on Allah and shame on Muhammad and shame on every Muslim who believe in that man to be a prophet. Yusuf. Uh, you have a few minutes for your rebuttal? Yeah, yep, we have you, Yusuf. You can go ahead. You have five minutes for your rebuttal. Okay, this is my rebuttal or my closing statement. I just want to... Okay, I, I hope I, because I lost my connection. I've just lost that entire discussion with the summer, so I never heard anything on that point. Let me just start off by saying that at the outset, I did basically ask, the question was, is ISIS a true representation for Islam? And I pointed out that Osama Dagdub comes from an extremist Christian fundamentalist background, and he doesn't have the moral proclivity to basically launch a critique against Islam or even give a justifiable attack against Islam on the basis that a lot of these individuals who form part and parcel of ISIS are scriptural illiterates. They are novices. They have no background. They have no knowledge of the Islam. I pointed out that ISIS engages in many practices like sex slavery, burning, slavery of people, killing, genocide, and all these particular aspects of ISIS, you find mirror images in the context of the Old Testament. 
you find in the end times when Jesus comes, he's going to slay his enemies. In Luke 19, 27, he says, those enemies of mine who would not that I would reign over them, bring them here and lay them before me. So when we ask the question, is ISIS an Islamic movement? And particularly when this comes from a Christian polemicist who engages in a form of gutter polemics, you begin to ask the question, how can someone be so deceitful, so lying to such an extent that he totally glosses over the discrepancies and atrocities and abuse in his book that he views as authoritative, and then basically goes on an attack on another particular region. In fact, I may point the idea that Osama Dagdok, in fact, empowers the extremists. Because if you look at the extremists in the world, they are minority. We all agree about it. The vast majority are not extremists. They are minority. But Osama Dagdok's views and the views of his namesake, Osama bin Laden, are the same. Do you know that? So you would be in their same camp, and if you would be a Muslim, I would be very afraid of you, Osama, because you'd basically be empowering the extremists, and you'd be empowering the violence that we see in the world, which means that you are part and parcel of the problem. I wonder in the time that you basically mentioned, and I wanted to hold you by that, are you willing to apologize on public table, on public uh, TV, that in an interview with Jim Schneider, you falsely stated that a woman who is raped has to bring 84 uh, eyewitnesses. Where did you get that from? I'm just asking you a simple question. You also mentioned that the Prophet Muhammad fired Aisha. Where did you get that from? Give me a single hadith, single hadith reference. There's a fatwa. Do you know that there's a fatwa in Saudi Arabia where someone mentions the issue of thawing? Can you give me a single hadith? where thawing is mentioned, a single hadith or anywhere in the Sira literature where the Prophet thawed Asha. So the question is, why do you lie openly on these particular issues? Why do you lie deceitfully on these particular issues? And I think your game has been thoroughly exposed tonight, Osama, for the lies, propaganda and vicious stereotype that you basically mentioned. I mentioned the fact that in the Quran, the Quran states clearly that Allah does not forbid you with regard to those who do not fight you on account of your religion, nor drive you out to be good to them, to be kind to them. Now, on what basis do you say that this is in fact abrogated? I don't understand you. I really do not understand you. On what basis do you say that Surah 9 verse 6 is abrogated by Surah 9 verse 5? I mean, that, that's insane. Surah 9 verse 6 comes after Surah 9 verse 5, and yet you claim that Surah 9 verse 6 is abrogated by verse 5. What kind of logic is this that you're applying? It's totally, totally ludicrous, totally de deceitful, and totally um, dishonest and disingenuous. Coming back to Surah 9 verse 5, let's look at it in context. It basically says that in verse 4, Except those whom you made a treaty among the polytheists, that they have not been deficient to you, you are to fulfill it to the entire end. It basically goes on to say, why will you not fight people in Surah 9 verse 5, who one, broke their oaths, two, aimed at the expulsion of the Prophet, three, attacked you first. Do you fear them? But Allah has the right more to fear him. They respect neither ties of relationship nor keep their covenants. Surah 9 verse 6, if any of the pagans, that is those who broke the treaty, it's referring to those who broke the treaty, seek thy protection, protect him. And not only that, convey him to a secure environment. You have one environment. minute, one minute remains. Some deck talk, my dear friend. You an Arab speaker, I'm not Arabic. You attack me for not being able to speak Arabic. What part of that verse in English or Arabic do you know? I know your, your English is very poor. I know that. I, I, I have a difficulty hearing you. What part in Arabic do you not understand? Surah 9 verse 6 speaks about pagans who broke their treaty. And then in that context, even in the context of warfare, if they ask your protection, protect him. What part of that verse don't you understand? Why do you engage in this duplicitous double standards? Why do you basically deceitfully engage in this double standards and inherent double standards on a numerous scale? You cannot deny the fact that in the Old Testament, Moses commands a murder of approximately 100,000 young males and roughly 68,000 helpless women. You haven't answered the point. Yahweh inspired this, meaning you believe this is from Yahweh, and he tells the soldiers in the field, kill all the boys, but keep all alive for yourself those girls who have not had sex with man. Question to you, how does a soldier in the field have uh, determined whether a woman is a virgin? Osama, is you, you have five women? minutes to go ahead and uh, rebuttal and make all your right, conclusion. All right, the contradiction, thank you, brother. The contradiction in Islam is beyond my imagination. The contradiction is beyond my imagination. Not just in the Quran, in the Hadith. I can show you how dumb your scholars are because they put the Hadith like that. Muhammad commanded not to kill women and children. And they give you the Hadith. The Hadith after it, Muhammad commanding the killing of the children and women. They give you Hadith, Muhammad commanded not to burn the cities where you involved in, in war. The following Hadith, Muhammad commanding to burn the city. 
Your scholars are dumbers. I know that's not a word, but I made it just for you, so you know that my English is not that good. Huh? Listen, my friend, your Quran contradicts itself. Your Allah contradicts himself. Your Muhammad contradicts himself. Your scholars are dumbers. I can't help it. Now, the story about four witnesses, it's because Aisha, your mother, your mother, the mother of all the believers, have committed adultery with a man by the name Safwan. And they brought three eyewitness. And Muhammad stayed at home for a whole month. That's not my words. That's your scholars, or you can call them dumbers, interpretations, they're teaching. You need to learn Arabic and go read this on your own websites, okay? In your own books. I'm not going to teach you Arabic. You can teach yourself. You wasted so much time to memorize Arabic words. No, it's learn Arabic, okay? So he stayed at home a whole week. Could not go out because he was embarrassed. His favorite wife, the little one, the six years old baby. Well, guess what? Muhammad was saved by Jibreel. He came to him and said, uh-uh, you must have four eyewitnesses. Even though the Bible said two eyewitnesses is enough, but Muhammad needs four. I promise you. Have they brought to Muhammad 300 eyewitnesses? He'll ask for 301. But anyway, so that's the story about Aisha. Go read it in your own books. You should be embarrassed of yourself and of your child molester Muhammad. But anyway, uh, let's go now. You tell me that the ISIS people that have no knowledge are all uneducated. They're all poor. No, they are scholars. They can read and, and, and write everything. Because they actually know the Quran much better than you. And they know the interpretation of the Quran better than you. Uh, in your statement uh, that the greatest conquest was given by Allah to Muhammad, uh, it's actually because he, uh, he uh, uh, whatever you said. Let me, let, me, let me tell you the answer now. You're taking verse out of context. Surely we, con we, we uh, uh, conquest for you a clear conquest. Listen to verse 2, Quran chapter 48, verse 2, that Allah may forgive you for your past sin and for, for your future sin and to, and to fulfill his grace on you and guide you to a straight way. Can you imagine with me? The great conquest Allah gave to Muhammad is not the, some peace uh, uh, agreement he have with some infidel, some Jews, or some Christian, or some wicked. No, it is the forgiveness of his sin. And by the way, that's not my interpretation. That is Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Kasir, Al-Jarlain. Advice you again, stop being a Muslim for a couple, three years. Learn Arabic, go read these scholars, real scholars books. Your interpretations means nothing. Not to me, not to ISIS members, not to the 40% of the Muslim of the world. 40% listen to you right now and they laugh at you because they say you are being used by somebody else. They brainwash you with this loving peace of Islam which have no truth at all. Now, chapter 9 verse 5 has been abrogated by chapter 9 verse 6. That's not my word, my friend. I don't believe in chapter 9. 9, 5, 9, 6 under my shoes. I don't believe in your Quran. But your scholars tell me that. He said, he said, okay. وقال آخرون هو منسوخ ذكر من قال ذلك حدثنا أحمد ابن إسحاق قال سناء ابن أحمد قال سناء سفيان عن جوير عن الضحاك فاقتلوا المشركين حيث وجدتموهم Here is the verse That is the verse abrogated So kill the policists wherever you find them نسختها Okay Now did I make this up? I'm reading your, your book If you are that idiot and you cannot read your own books I can't help you my friend so far, I did not say one word tonight. Go back and watch the whole entire thing we talked so far tonight. It is your scholar interpretation. It's your Muhammad's writing from his uh, bibliography by Ibn Sham and others. It is your Quran. I, I, I don't believe in that. That is trash. I don't believe in it. The entire Quran is a joke. 9-6 has been abrogated by 9-5, the verse which came before it. Does this make any sense? It does not make any sense whatsoever. It is dumb. It is dumb for dumber who believe in it, which is the calls them in Islam Muslim scholars. That's what they said. Do I believe in it? No. Will I ever believe in it? No. I promise you. When you cut your head off, as you saw in the video you put in your uh, teaching about ISIS, if you do that to me, I will never believe in that trash. Because when I die, killed by Muslim like you or others, I will make it to heaven. And when you die, you're going to spend your eternity with Allah, Satan in hell, and your Muhammad, the self-proclaimed prophet of Islam, in hell forever. I advise you to learn the truth about Islam. We have a caller, Bashar, from USA. You're online. You can go ahead and state your question. How are you doing, Pastor Chris? How are you doing, Pastor Osama? Good, 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 to, good to have you. Good to have you. What's your question? Actually, my question is for Yusuf. Um, I just wanted to quote a verse and ask him what he thinks. Uh, verse uh, 111 from chapter 9 on Hawba says, indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties in exchange that they will have paradise. 
They fight in the cause of Allah, so they kill and are killed. It is a true promise, binding him in the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran, who is truer to keep his covenant than Allah. So rejoice in your transaction which you have contracted. It is that which is a great attainment. My question is, this sounds a lot like ISIS, so I would like you to explain why this verse sounds like them, as well as there is no binding in the Torah or the Gospel that says we are purchased to be killed. So I'd like him to answer that. Okay, look, uh, he Thank you. Hello. Did you understand the question, Yusuf? Hello, yeah, just saying good, again, cut off again, the, the last point. He quoted Surah 9, verse 111, and I'll basically read it out to you quite quickly. Behold, Allah has bought of the believers their lives and their possessions, promising them paradise in return, and so they fight in Allah's cause and God's cause, and slay and are slain, a promise which in truth he has willed upon himself, in the words of the Torah and the Gospel and the Quran, and who could be more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Now, from the context of what we look, you need to juxtapose the Quranic verse with the primary verse in Surah 2, verse 190, which says, fight those who fight against you, but do not commit acts of aggression. So you cannot basically look at this particular passage in isolation and then basically believe that this is a wholesale sanguinary warfare and massacre that you find where people are engaging in massacre, people are engaging in killing each other, and therefore you just simply go and kill people for the sake of killing them. It doesn't basically apply in that case because there are qualifying passages in the Quran which states that when the unbelievers or when those who fight you desist from fighting you, you are also desist from fighting them. The Quran takes into account the fact that in certain circumstances war in fact becomes inevitable. And so when you fight in war, you're obviously going to kill people. You're obviously going to slay people. It's not a pacifist religion. In the books of Joshua, you find that Joshua massacred the tribes of Ai and um, the different communities. And you find the same in the passages of Moses. Those who are aggressive warfare institutionalized by Yahweh. In the context of the Quran, this verse is not extremely provocative. It's not aggressive. It is in the context of defense of warfare. And I think the brother needs to basically go back, read the Quranic text, and juxtapose it with the passages which put a qualifier. Osama, go ahead. There are verses in the Quran teach, you only kill those who kill you. And all these verses has been abrogated. No sikhat. Your scholar said that. You need to confess it and get off the stupid Islam you have in your head. It is no sikhat. Because the final word of Allah, wherever you find them, you search for them and kill them. No sikhat. Ibn Kasir said no sikhat. al Khurtibi said no sikhat. al tabari said no sikhat. al Jalan said no sikhat. The verses you are quoting are no sikhat. Stop playing a game with, the, with your... Uh, you brainwash your own self. You cannot get out of it. Any verse does not have killing is abrogated. Abu Ubaidah said that. Do you see in that verse you kill them? No. If they stop killing you, you stop killing them. That's not a right verse. Why? Because you kill them until the religion of Allah, Islam, will take supremely. And there is no option. Muhammad was commanded to engage in war against people until people become Muslims. If you don't become Muslims, we're going to kill you. We're going to take your wife and we'll take your daughters to raise them, to raise Muslim babies. Uh, this, this is Jay's original question to Yusuf. Yusuf, I'll, I'll uh, repeat Jay's question. I have it here in front of me. This one's to you, Yusuf. Would the Muslim community accept to be the dhimis of non-Muslims, pay the jiza, be subdued as second-class citizens, and have the Pact of Umar applied to them, where one cannot proselytize or build new places of worship? If this system is seen as fair to non-Muslims, then why shouldn't it be fair to be applied to Muslims? Oh, good question. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a silly question to ask. Number one. If you're talking about basically building places of worship, the Islamic point of view is that Christianity is false. Uh, God cannot come down to earth and die for the sins of humanity. If God died, then who would look after the affairs of the world? The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. When people teach this kind of nonsensical nonsense, then effectively, from an Islamic perspective, or certain Muslim countries who prohibit building of churches or proselytizing, at least 
prohibit proselytizing, they would basically argue on the basis that you cannot promote false doctrine and false belief. And on that basis, if someone says, for example, you have a teacher in a school, he tells you two plus two is equal to five. You know that two plus two is equal to four. Why would you get someone in school to go and teach you that two plus two is equal to five? However, the Quran does in fact protect places of worship. In Surah 22 verse 67, it says there quite categorically that if some people did not basically stop others or engage in defense of warfare against others, then you would find that mosques, synagogues, churches, they would all be destroyed. So the Quran protects worship. It protects religious worship. But in certain Muslim countries, they have the prohibition from proselytization because of the false doctrine. Speaking about jizya, the jizya was far less than the zakat. You know that? And the jizya was never imposed on women. It was never imposed on the elderly. It was never imposed on children. And it was never imposed on those who were religious in the community, religious leaders in the community. They were never imposed. The jizya was there in lieu of military uh, conscription. So in other words, if you are living in an Islamic state and you don't want to basically partake in defending the land itself, then you would pay a poll tax, but the poll tax would be lesser than the zakat. And the main reason was that because the state itself would provide you for protection. So the reason for the jizya, historically speaking at the very least, or in the classical sense, was in lieu of military conscription. I think that's a classical point that you need to understand. And, it, and, and people were exempt from it. The elderly were exempt, children were exempt, teenagers were exempt. Fighting men were only allowed to pay the jizya if they refused to stand up and defend the state. And it's important you need to understand and know that. That's okay. I love it how you just love to quote the Quran, which you memorize by your head, but you never use your brain to understand it. Muhammad protected the churches in what year? In the year 623. Because that verse was written in the Quran in Muhammad days. Do you know that the Christian in the churches in that days believed in the same Christianity which we Christians believe today? Was your Muhammad that stupid? He does not understand that the churches which exist in his days had Christians believe in Jesus to be the Son of God down the cross, rose from the dead? How dumb is this prophet? Are you, are you, do you have any logic yourself or you are dumb like your Muhammad? You quote verses written in the early days of Muhammad or even the early days of Medina where Muhammad was using it to practice taqiyya, to protect himself, to appease the Jews, to appease the Muslims, to appease the Christians. Go to Quran chapter 2 verse 62 where we learn that the, the believers, the Jews and the Christians and the Sabaeans, idol worshippers, everybody's good. Everybody's good. They die and they go to heaven. Just do good deeds and you make it to heaven. You go to Quran chapter 3 verse 8. Only the Muslims are good, and the rest are losers. You see how much contradiction in the Quran? But that's not contradiction. Why? Because Quran chapter 3, verse 85, abrogate, cancel, erase, delete. What is written in Quran chapter 2, verse 62? That's not my word. That's your scholars. You follow me so far? So how in the world Muhammad said in the Quran that he protects the Jews and the Christians and the synagogues and the churches, and he literally have freedom of religion? But at the same time, his followers today will not allow me to build a church or a synagogue in Mecca. Are you, are you listening to yourself, my friend? Or you really lost your brain completely? Are you out of your mind? If the same Christianity and the same Judaism which exists before Muhammad was a gleam in his father's eye, is the same Christianity we have today. If that verse is true, and if that verse is not abrogated, let me go to Mecca right now, and I would like to build a church, and I'll see who's going to help me to build it, and who's going to protect it. And with that, we have to close. We uh, have had a wonderful debate. Listen, the question we answer today is ISIS a true representation of Islam? We want you to remember that what, what the Word of God says in John chapter 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not perish and have everlasting life. We pray today that the Holy Spirit has opened up your heart to understand the truth of God's Word, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a number at the bottom of the screen. If you want to call in today, you want to give your heart to Jesus, receive Him into your life to save you, to deliver you, to heal you, and fill you with His Spirit, there's a number at the bottom of the screen where you can do that. We love you. We thank you for tuning in. We want to invite you to stay tuned as we have another show coming up tonight at 8 o'clock p.m. concerning science and atheism. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. We thank our guest speakers for being with us today. You've done a great job, and we look forward to seeing you again. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.